Notre Dame fans, welcome back to another edition of the Friday Mailbag. It is Friday, September 24th. It is the day before Notre Dame is set to take on Wisconsin. And we're here for all of it. <laughs> we're here to uh, answer your questions and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, we're ready to rock and roll, Vince. So let's go ahead and uh, and dive right in so we can get as many questions as possible before, okay. before you have to get out of here. Here we go. Ryan Gavin's leading us off. He says, how do Notre Dame's current offensive weapons rank versus other Brian Kelly teams? This one's right up your wheelhouse. You, this one's right up your wheelhouse. Yeah, so I was going through this list, Vince, and trying to think about like you know the, the best years of of Brian Kelly's tenure when it came to weapons. You know, you had ten and eleven in two thousand ten. You had Kyle Rudolph and Tyler Eifert at tight end. Although we didn't know that Tyler Eifert was going to be Tyler Eifert really till halfway right. the season when Kyle Rudolph went down. So I'm kind of looking retroactively, uh, but then. Kyle Rudolph gets hurt. I think it was against Navy. Tyler Eifert steps into place. Great job. Michael Floyd. You had TJ Jones. Uh, after that, there wasn't the depth. But you know, running back, you had Sear Wood. You had Theo Riddick playing slot receiver. Uh, then in 2011, obviously, you said Floyd and Eifert. You had Sear Wood. You had Jonas Gray emerge that year. You had Tyler Eifert at tight end. Uh, I would say the top level, I mean, that was about as good as it's going to get in regards to just the high-end talent. I don't think that group had the depth that this current group had. Then you have to go to, you know, to me, next is the, the fifth, 15 year for okay. me. You had CJ Procisus at running back. Obviously, you would have had Torian Folson. He got hurt. You had Josh Adams. You had Will Fuller. Uh, you had, Al, you know, Durham Smythe, Alize Mack. Then Alize Mack got hurt. Uh, Chris Brown, Amir Carlisle probably is next. Although that 13 group with – Devaris Daniels, TJ Jones in his senior year. Uh, you had Troy Nicholas at tight end. Will Fuller was a freshman. Corey Robinson were freshmen in that rotation. Um, you know, that that was a receiving core that was pretty good. Uh, I don't know if there's been a year where they've had the combination of running back, tight end, and right. receiver, and depth. Right. I think that ultimately, Vince, is where I'm coming from. I don't know if you can do better than Kyle Rudolph, Tyler Eifert, Michael Floyd, Theo Riddick, Sear Wood, and Jonas Gray on the same team. But those guys didn't all necessarily merge at the same time. And after them, it was like, okay, then it was like Daniel Smith. And, you know, it was a big drop off after the first couple guys at each position. I think sure. the depth of this group is what makes it so good. Uh, as far as proven talent, there's other classes that are other groups that are better. As far as just God-given ability, I, this group can can match up with anyone when you put all the skill positions together. In my opinion, what say you, Vince? No, I I, I think you make a very good argument. I, I like see I like the depth of this group, and I feel like you can go six deep. You know, as far as receiving threats or you know go to guys, I think you can go six deep on this team, and I don't know if you could necessarily say that completely on one uh -uh. team. Maybe. You know, once a guy established himself a year later, you know, that kind of thing because they were on the team. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know that you could have ever gone six deep and felt comfortable uh, like you can with this team. Right. Agree. You know? And so I, I think I'd have to give it to this year's squad. I think that's a legitimate argument. I really do. Now, they have to, to me, play better. Oh, yes. Uh, more consistently. But just we're just talking talent because we can't – we can't compare this group to past groups if we're talking about proven production because nobody on this group can, can remotely come close to Michael Floyd uh, or or what Theo Riddick did by the time his career was over. I mean, look, Kyron Williams right now can't compete with Sierra Wood and Theo Riddick for what they did for the entirety of their careers. He's only got one year under his belt, right? right. So we're looking at it based on you know where they are now and sort of projecting talent compared to what those guys are, have done with finished careers. Right. Right. And, and so it makes it a little bit challenging. But so so just off of ability, talent, and depth. And this has a chance to be a I mean, this is a yeah. really, really good. Because there's I mean, every one of these guys can come back next year, too. I yeah. mean, every one of them, if they want to think they will. But yes, but they could. And correct. they and that will yeah, Jack accentuate Cone, the only, their careers. Jack is the, and, and Kane Madden are the only guys on the offensive side of the ball that cannot come back next year. Right. Even one Josh, of them. Like, fifth year senior could come back because sure. of because of COVID. You can throw a party for either one of those two guys and it would be a different kind of party for both. 
<laughs> You're so mean. I know. <laughs> it's because I know I'm never going to meet Kane Madden in a dark alley somewhere. Yeah, because then you might you may be like, hey, Kane, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> and if I so do, you, I'm pretty bench, sure I can outrun him. You bench 450 so. pounds, huh? That's yeah. great, man. That right. Driscoll guy's always ragging on you. I've had your back the entire time, man. That's right. I don't know what you've been hearing. I don't know. Who ever told you that's a filthy liar? I loved I, you, man. I said, and I'm I could be quoted that I said I would throw you a party. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. The spin machine is in full effect today. Full effect. Full effect. All right. Uh Jordan Schreiber's up next. He says, Thanks for bringing us together. Friday mailbag. Can you do a Cooper Flanagan show? It just doesn't feel right. He's the only one of the last two years did not get a show. Even if you just record it, <laughs> he's not the only guy in the last two years that did a show. <laughs> but um, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll, 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 I made a note of that, Jordan. I made a note of that, so we'll, we'll look into that. It's um, yeah, yeah, we'll look into that. Vince, that's it was the that 2000, timing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. That was the 2023 yeah. tight end that committed, right? Uh, yeah, it was just that he he committed at, like the worst possible time for me yeah. in being able to produce a, a solo show. So I apologize, yeah. but yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Alan English, I used to always tell my defensive players that it was easier to be consistently dominant on defense because it's more about athleticism and effort, where offense is more about the game plan. What are your thoughts? I would actually say the opposite, because if it's about scheme, then it's easier for me to guarantee, like it's easier for Lincoln Riley to guarantee that his scheme is going to be on point than it is for him to guarantee he's always going to have really good defensive players, for example. Uh so I would I would say the opposite is true because the one it, it, because because according to your theory, because defense is so much more driven by the Jimmys and Joes, which to a degree is true. I don't buy that as much as people make it out. Uh, I still think scheme is important. Uh, you know that's why this you know a, a a roster in 2017 with the same players that actually fewer players than what Brian Van Gorder had in 2016 can look better than what they had or why. You know, Mike Elko's first defense in 2017 at Notre Dame that didn't have Jalen Smith, that didn't have, you know, Cole Luke, that didn't have a lot of the players that Brian Van Gorder had on that really talented 2015 team, uh, gave up significantly fewer points, like three fewer points per game, you know, uh, gave up less yards per game, gave up fewer yards per play, all, all over half a yard fewer for, per play. So I think coaching still matters on defense. I think it's a, it's kind of a bit of a cop out to say, oh, gee, you know, because look, Oklahoma's had some really good recruiting classes with defensive players. And then those team guys turned out to be really crappy yeah. on defense. So I still think coaching matters. But just with this basing on this premise, I, I do think it's a little easier to scheme your way into success on offense. I, I do believe that. But I think you need talent on both sides of the ball. But if this premise is true and there is some truth to it, I still think it's easier to have great offenses year after year because it's less predicated on having that top level talent and that top level experience because I can coach my way into points based yeah. on theory. Is how yeah, I, I can coach my way into points. I, I totally get that. And I, I think defensively you can play with your hair on fire a little bit more and, and you have to be within the scheme, I think, a little bit more on offense. I think that's kind of where Allen is coming from. And I get that. I, I do. Um, I, I like my defense to play. I don't want to say haphazard, but, you know, just kind of, hey, man, let's go. Who let the dogs out kind of thing? Let's go play. Uh, I So I get where Allen's coming from. I also agree with what you said. Uh, but I I can scheme my way into points. So I, I, I'd agree with that on offense for sure. It, scheme isn't going to help you on defense. It can. But if you don't have dudes on defense – that you're in trouble. In there's a, there's a, see, I don't know if I'd say you're in trouble because I could, I could go through and point to teams that didn't have a lot of NFL players on defense that were really good on defense. But if you matched up against an, an equally coached offense with better players, you're going to get run. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, so, so what I would say is, is I, I, I think that you have to be coached well on defense, no matter how good your players yeah. are. And, and I and I continue to point to the Brian Van Gorder era. I mean, look at all the NFL players that were on that 2015 defense. Um, and and I, But at, at the same time, you, you, the a greatest coach in the world is not going to have the 85 Bears if the 85 right. Bears doesn't have future Hall of Famers on it, right? You know, Michael Singletary, Richard Day. Sure. I mean, that had some great players on it. Dave Dorson, Otis Wilson. I mean, that's some really, really good players on it. Steve McMichael. I mean, I'm just could go through the, the line as they pop in my head. Yeah. Uh, you probably could do that a little easier than me, right, Vince? Aren't you a Bears fan? Well, yeah, but I was four. So, well, I mean, but you got to go back I mean, and study it. You know just, what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. I, I, 
I, I, I was a little more when John Havlicek and Bob yeah. Cousy and Bill Russell were dominating <laughs> for the Celtics and Sam Jones and Casey Jones and or Look Sam White and Casey Jones. And I mean, you know what I mean? But I still know it because, you know, that's what you do when you're a fan just, of a team. You're a better man than I am. I mean, but that th- th- that being true doesn't take away from the fact <laughs> that you still need to know more about the 85 Bears. <laughs> You kind of walked right into that one. Uh, they had a punky QB. That's what I know. Oh, uh, well. That's straight from the Super okay. Bowl shuffle, baby. Okay. All right, anyway. Uh, Irish for Life says, not commenting, hurt too much. Glad to be here. God bless IB Nation. Irish for Life, you're on our prayers, man. Yeah, man. We, we hope you're feeling better real you soon. You and your, uh, and your, four, your four-legged, four-legged family member. Absolutely. So. Yep, Absolutely. Uh, clash more Mike to uh, Jordan's message about Cooper Flanagan. He said, I said it on the message board. I think Cooper Flanagan is a perfect fit for a conversion to an offensive tackle. So I'll ask what your thoughts are on that one, Brian. I, I like him at tight end. I have not seen him up close enough to, or seen his body enough to see if, if I, if to, to, to be able to confidently say he can be 295 plus, uh, hopefully 300 plus. I like him at tight end. The other, the other part of that too, Mike, is a guy going from tight end to to tackle like that, who doesn't have a dad that played, you know, offensive line in, in high college like Joe Walt, Joe Walt, yeah, right, and whose dad didn't play in the NFL, who can kind of school him up, requires top notch coaching, and yeah, yeah, enough said, <laughs> enough said. Uh, let's see, Alan English. Also, I see Hamilton as an ideal cover three safety, but was interested in your thoughts and or what NFL teams could best use his talent. I'll answer the last part, all of them. Well, and that answers the first part. Kyle <laughs> Hamilton is the ideal insert what your defense is. Yeah. yeah. You know what exactly. I mean? I, and what I mean by that, Alan, is we're, I'm not trying to be dismissive of your question. I think he could be a great cover three safety. I think he could be a great cover four safety. I think he can be an in-the-box safety. I think Kyle Hamill can do whatever the heck you want him to do outside of putting him a middle linebacker. Yeah. I mean, he he is a special, special talent. And, and you know, I mean, you, you think about it, he's a faster version of Jeremiah Wusu Koromo with three more inches in height. I mean, you know, you talk about just the diversity of, of what he can yeah. do. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, he, he is a special weapon. So, yeah, could he be – if your NFL team runs cover three or a lot of cover one and you need that great middle of the field safety, sure, he could do that. I don't know if that's what I would want him doing all the time just because that there's going to be limitations to how much that guy can be around the ball right. because you have him further away from everything else. Yeah, but, and I don't think you're using him to his potential. Yeah. You I know? mean, just but if that's your need and and you just – the way that you use your corners and your slots and you're super aggressive and you need that eraser of free safety, sure, go for it. Uh, I think Kyle Hamlet can do whatever the heck you ask him to do on defense, and, and that's what makes it – another thing that makes him so unique is – if you can't find a way, if if Kyle Hamilton doesn't fit your defense, you gener- generally speaking as a defensive coach, then the problem is you, yeah. and you need to find a new defense. Yeah. Simple as that. Yep. Could not agree more. Andrew Goss says, I see people predicting Wisconsin to score 40. I want whatever they're on. I, is, are people actually doing that? Are there people actually predicting Wisconsin score I forty points? Just don't see it. This isn't Eastern Michigan that I don't. Playing. It's I'm that sorry. scene from uh, Anchorman. I don't believe you. <laughs> you have to show me. I need to I see. Don't it. I don't believe you. <laughs> I don't believe you. I'm telling you right now. Notre Dame gets to thirty. They win the game. I, I don't see. I just don't see Wisconsin getting even get into the thirties, let alone forty. I'd be shocked. I would be, be shocked. Just flabbergasted if that happens. I don't know what – I mean, they barely got into the 30s against Eastern Michigan. Like, what about this team makes you think that they can score that many points? Yeah, I mean, I, just, I, I go back and look at, you know, and, and what was it, Vince? We talked about this last year against Wake Forest. They got to, was it 42 points? But, like, they had a two defensive touchdowns, another uh, touchdown that was set up by a really super right. short field. Like, what about this Wisconsin team makes you think they can score over 40, you know, over 30 something against a good team? I just, I don't see it. I mean, in their last seven games, they've scored seven, six, seven, 20, 42 with multiple defensive scores, uh, 10 and 34 against a MAC team. I, yeah, I just, I, I don't see it. I don't see it either. And I'm sorry, but this Notre Dame defense is the one thing that I am absolutely confident in going into this matchup. Yeah. 
I, yeah. that's yeah, absolutely. Uh, Allen has a good point here. He goes, I wouldn't be surprised if the total isn't in the forties between the two teams. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's more reasonable. Me. Yeah, yeah. That's more reasonable. Uh, I just, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, there's a, you know, part of the reason I don't really read a lot of other people I've explained it, but sometimes it's just like, it can be frustrating when you read like certain people from different places. Not, I'm not about Notre Dame people. It's just like, I have to, I've had to stop reading ESPN. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll look at certain articles that you know maybe we're going to turn into a, a response article you know power rankings or something like that. But uh, I just s- some of this stuff, Vince. I have to just kind of be like, okay, I, I can't. I, I don't want to raise my blood pressure today. I don't yeah. want to get too fired up. It's just I. It's kind of like that scene from uh, I, I'm I'm in a movie mood today. <laughs> Good. I and like uh, the scene from Billy Madison, which I thought was otherwise a pretty stupid movie. But that scene where he's like, you know, we're all now dumber for having listened to that. Like, right. that's kind of what I feel like I, I experienced too much when I'm reading some of this national stuff. So, um, you know, I, I just I'd be shocked if 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 people are, are actually are actually picking, um, you know, I just yeah, I don't see it. I don't see it. You there, Vince? Yeah, no, I'm I'm looking Okay, we had a couple questions here that I'll that I'll get to. Uh, one from Tom Ryan. He says Cone oh. wins the QB battle more than we've gotten down more. that far yet. Gotcha. Well, we just the one that you saw Andrew Goss about the score in forty was below those. No, it's not. The, these two. I'm just looking at it. These two are above it at twelve twenty nine. Uh, Cone wins the QB battle more than which more than offsets the brute force of the Badgers. I uh, agree with you. Tommy Gunn says, won't happen, I'm sure, but if Cleveland could pair JOK with Kyle Hamilton in the NFL, Cleveland would have to totally collapse or make a trade to be able to be high enough to pick Kyle Hamilton. So, yeah, I don't I don't see that one. I don't see that one happening at all, in my, in my opinion, Vince. So No, I don't either. Yeah. I, I, don't think, I don't think Cleveland's going to be that high. They're not going to be high enough to, yeah. to select Hamilton. That's not yep. – definitely not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Demetrius Rex says, two days ago, I'm super confident. Now I'm not. Best to have expectations low, I guess. Well, I, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, Demetrius, I, sometimes I feel like as you get closer to game day, that can happen, you know, where you start kind of thinking of all the things that could go wrong. Uh, I just say, hey, look, you know, sit back, relax, and enjoy it because, um, you know, I, I don't, and I got no, I've got no reason for this, but I, I just, I don't know, Vince. I have a, I, I feel good about tomorrow. I do. I, I do too. I, and maybe it's just because I'm not respecting Wisconsin enough. That could very well be it. It could very well be it. I just don't have a lot of respect for Wisconsin. If Notre Dame loses Wisconsin tomorrow, it's going to say a lot more about Notre Dame than it does Wisconsin, in right. my opinion. I completely agree. They're going to have to make mistakes that Wisconsin, you know, jumps on. Um, and I, so it's going to be self-inflicted wounds. I, I mean, I just, I don't see Wisconsin taking it to Notre Dame and scoring a bunch of points. I just, I don't see it. And the film that I've watched and the teams that I've seen, you know, Wisconsin put on the field, I just don't see that being the case. So, I mean, we'll, we'll we shall see. Uh, Anthony Solomon, size versus speed and athleticism. We will find out tomorrow which staff chose correctly. Interesting. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's so much about which one chooses correctly as much as which one employs it correctly. I think yeah. that's that. It's more about that. But um, I would always prefer size and speed. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of fair enough. I think that's what's made Alabama so unique over these years. Is and it's you know Brian Kelly used to talk about the big skill, and we haven't heard that phrase a lot. But I, I'm a big fan of that. You know, really athletic big guys, and then obviously having speed on the perimeter. I think is. The way to go, and I think that's partly why I, I I like this Notre Dame defensive line so much. Is you know you've got a 260 pound guy like Isaiah Foskey. I mean he's you know, he kind of moves like a guy that normally is like 230. I mean he kind of moves I think like like Julian Aguara, but he's 20 pounds bigger than Julian Aguara was. Maybe more depending on which year we're talking about Julian Aguara. His weight always seemed to fluctuate between 230 and 240 through his career. But, but yeah, big big skill is is the way to go. But yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see which staff is better able to utilize yes. what they have built. Absolutely. Tomorrow. Tommy Guns jumping in. Which D line has more sacks? I think that's very interesting. And I hate to say it, but I 
I think Wisconsin's going to have more sacks. Uh, mm-hmm. Just not. I'm not saying that they're going to win, but I think they're going to have more sacks just based on Notre Dame's going to drop back more, so they're going to have more opportunities. And Notre Dame's offensive line is not great, so I I'm going with Wisconsin on this. Uh, I don't have a, a guess on this. I'm going to tell you if it's a close game, it'll be Wisconsin. If it's a game that Notre Dame is in control for much of the game, it'll be Notre Dame. Because to Vince's point, if the game is close, and that means Wisconsin's able to stay in their base offense, they can run the ball, they can pound it and do all you know, quick game and you know all that type of stuff, which is going to limit sacks. If the, if Wisconsin gets in a situation where Notre Dame jumps on them a couple scores and they've got to throw the ball more, then it'll be Notre Dame. Yeah, uh, but I mean, the way that Notre Dame's offensive line has been blocking lately, I just I have Oof. very little faith that they're going to protect the quarterback in this game. Agreed. Which is the only reason I have it as, as close of a game as I – look, my 24-19 prediction from yesterday is 100% about I don't have confidence that the offensive line is going to step up. If I mm-hmm. did, I would p- predict a more convincing win. I would be yeah. – I would have predicted a more convincing win than you have even. And you have a 10-point win. Yeah. Well, Tim Hatch has a more convincing win than I had. He said Notre Dame 31, Wisconsin 17, and go Irish, which I love. Here we go, Demetrius Rex. Compare how you presently view the current team after three games versus how you viewed past Notre Dame teams after three games Hmm. from 18 to 20. You know, that's kind of part of the reason, Demetrius, and, and that I'm not as panicked about this season being a collapse as other seasons. Uh, you know, I, I thought 2017, so let's just focus on sort of the rebirth of Notre Dame. 2017, I thought this team was really good after three games. They had the close loss to Georgia where they really outplayed Georgia, I felt. They just missed some opportunities. Sure. They blasted Temple in the opener, ran for a ton of yards, destroyed Boston College, ran for over 500 yards. Like, you knew pretty early that year that this team's really good. Right. In 2018, they had a nice one over Michigan, but they looked like trash in beating Ball State and Vanderbilt the next two games. Uh, You know, Ball State that year was not very good. Vanderbilt that year was not very good. Ball State finished that season uh, four and eight, and they (laughs) were coming off. You know, they ended up losing a week later by 28 to Indiana. They lost to Western Kentucky. They lost to Northern Illinois. They lost to Eastern Michigan by 22. They lost to Ohio by 38. They lost Ooh. to Toledo by 32. They lost to Miami of Ohio by 21. Notre Dame beat them by eight. Uh, then a week later, they played Vanderbilt, who went six and seven that year. Uh, a week after losing to Notre Dame by five, uh, Vanderbilt w- w- hosted hosted South Carolina and lost 37 to 14. So uh, I did not feel great about that team. And, you know, part of the difference is, is there's not the quarterback change possibility to, to, to make that would spark things that people maybe think there is in this thing. I think it's more about the offensive line needing to maybe see some personnel yeah. turnover. Maybe that could be the thing that sparks it. Of course, the biggest personnel turnover that would spark the offensive line is not going to happen because it's not someone that's going to be playing on Saturdays. Uh, but – uh, you know, 2018 didn't feel great about the team after three games. 2019, uh, you know, sloppy win over Louisville. Yes, they beat by New Mexico by a lot, but that was a terrible New Mexico, New Mexico team. Was and, horrible. And I did not feel great about how that team played. They did not play great against Georgia. And honestly, they played pretty bad the first half against Virginia the next week, too. Virginia was out playing them. And then the second half, the defensive line just took that game over and just flat out dominated them. And from that point on, that team was better. Uh, but never, I mean, I, I never really felt good about that team. Even late in the year when they were beating teams convincingly, it's like these teams stink. And they're just out towning them with Chase Claypool and Cole Komet and Braden Lindsay. That's when Braden Lindsay took off. You know, and then last year, I didn't feel very good about this team after three games either. You know, they look like trash against Duke. Uh, South Florida was awful. Uh, didn't play great against Florida State were pretty bad against Louisville. It really wasn't until the pit game that this team started to take off. That was game five. Of course, the difference was is last year, you know, they went almost a full month without playing between South Florida and Florida State because of COVID. And, you know, so it it just – every circumstance is different, but I don't think this, you know, rough start is necessarily unique uh, compared to what we've seen from this program in recent I mean really the only year that I ever fought man after three games this team is really good was 2017 yeah 
And we're not going to see that because they don't have Quentin Nelson and Mike McGlinchey and right. Alex Bars and Sam Mustafer. This <laughs> offensive line will never be what that is. It no. Is, I mean, they're, it they can get the talent better. to be that. It, uh, and they don't have to be right. that, though. They don't right. have to be that. Right. I just no one should there. ever have expected it to be last year's unit right. or the 2017 unit. Now, yeah. could Tosh Baker eventually be an All American? Could Blake? Could Rocco? Sure. Sure. But in 2021, never expected those guys to right. look like Quentin Nelson. All we've yeah. ever said is just be solid. That's it. Yep. I don't think that should be asking too much. I don't. I really don't. These guys were highly recruited after all. I mean, and, the, the, and they're not young, like Brian Kelly likes to say. They're not. And I hear it from not just him, but from some of his mouthpieces too. Like they're not young. I'm sorry. No. They're not. They're they're young and experienced, maybe some of them, but they're not young. Right. All right. David Knight. OMG, I saw an Ian book. I saw Ian book in a commercial yesterday. I was like, ain't this nothing? <laughs> what is he possibly peddling? I'm wondering, but I, I guess I don't know. So, David, please, I need to know what this is about. Thank you. Caleb Collins says, What happened to the other weekly big matchup prediction videos you guys were doing? Well, we did those week one. Uh, there was a lot of big games that week. So, we felt like mm-hmm. we needed to kind of, you know, Add a little bit of something, something to it. To be perfectly honest with you, it's a time issue. Yeah, um, it's it's and it's on me. I'll take full blame on this one. Um, usually, we do them on Thursday nights, and I'm at my kid's game, and there's just it's just a timing thing. It's finding the time to sit down and do it. But it's something that we'd like to get back to. Uh, and freshman football season is rapidly wrapping up, uh, mm-hmm. so we might be able to well, like, make like that. last night. You know, I call you, and you know, hey. Got to come pick something up real quick at the house, and Vince is like, uh, "I'm at my kid's game." So, yeah. I mean, there would have, there it wouldn't have been an option. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so we're, I we do want to get back to that, and when there's a and, big game, and, and right, and, and this is know. year one for us. I mean, this is right. our first season with the YouTube channel. We always have aspirations of growing and adapting and changing. Sure. It's just we we also have to be careful that we're not spreading ourselves too thin, right. and you know, we do have the website and. You know, we've got more help this year on the website, but I still have a ton of website responsibilities to do. And sure, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. As long as you stick with us, this is going to be a fun ride. This isn't going to be Absolutely. it for the rest of eternity and as far as what <laughs> yeah. we're going to provide. We have a lot of plans and, and, and growing. And, and one of the things that, that I decided that the first few months of taking over this site, I tried to do everything. I tried to do like we we're going to podcast. And, I, and it was like, okay, nothing is getting enough attention. So we kind of did a restart. And at that time, it was just me because Vince yeah. was – you know, had replaced me at BGI. So he was still working at BGI. Uh, and it was like, look, okay, we're going to focus on the website first. Then we're going to do the podcast. Then we went to YouTube. So we're trying to get things rolling at first. And then once we kind of get things going, okay, now let's add to it as opposed to just, you know, right. Yep. Yeah. And learning we're, from our mistakes, we've promised things. Oh, yeah. Hey, we're going to do this. And then we're just, we have the time. So now we're just right. like, okay, let's not promise it until we can, and that's the biggest thing because we we want to be men of our word and we don't want to promise stuff that we can't fulfill. Um, that that's big for us. So AJ has a Tyler Buckner question. It only took us a half hour to get to a Tyler Buckner question. So thank you, AJ. Uh, with Buckner being a part of the offense, do you hope that Reese slash BK allow him to throw the ball more as well? Seems like if they don't, defenses will know exactly what to expect when he comes into the game. I would imagine that the package is going to expand. I would imagine mm-hmm. that the package has already expanded. They just haven't shown it yet uh, because they haven't needed to. That That's the big thing. He He's still being successful doing what he's doing. But, yes, of course, you have to add to it. You can't just come to the table with the same stuff every single game. Otherwise, it is going to get shut down. No question. So, yes, I do believe they are going to allow him and ask him to throw more uh, when he is in the game. I'm glad they didn't put more on him early. Yes. I mean, he's played two games, really one and a half games, because he he came out of last week's game. Mm-hmm. I, I think slowly expanding his role is the key. And sometimes it's it's okay for them to know what you're doing because then you can use it to your – like look at the Chris Tyree touchdown against against Toledo. Yeah. I mean, they had kind of run it, run it, run it. He's running, and all of a sudden they think, oh, gee, let's go tackle and the then, quarterback, and he just, you know, dumps it off to Chris Tyree. So – uh, I, I, I've liked what they've done so far, but yes. I mean, and look, they've tried to throw it. I mean, the f- third play he ever played, he drops back and he's trying to throw a stutter and go to Brain Lindsay and he gets hit in the back, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, because the offensive line couldn't protect for him. You know, there, right. there's been a couple times they've called RPOs where he should have pulled it and got outside and you have George Tack is wide open. So, 
uh, they, they've tried. You know, I think there were some throws that were in the, the call sheet for him against Purdue, but then he had to come out of the game because he got injured. So right. uh, I do think there are things there. It's just you, you get to him because you, when you need to, not necessarily, right. you know, don't want to force it too much. Because then what if he makes a mistake or he gets hit by the, you know, the pass rush gets to him. And, you know, there's, there's other reasons why maybe it's not, why we haven't seen a more expanded packet so far. Way off topic, but I'm going there anyway. I'm really bothered by this gray hair right here. That's all I can notice when I'm looking at myself. I need to shave. That's all there is to it. I'm getting old, Brian. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like off-centered. It's like off to the side. I don't like it. Anyway, uh, Domer Grizz, happy Friday. Is this a game where we see more Bauer and White together with Bertrand without a rover in a more traditional 4-3 personnel didn't cincinnati do that versus georgia now we talked about that yesterday or is it uh, wednesday we talked yes. about that so we talked about how against georgia they went to a four a true four three type of look that but that was when georgia went 12 personnel right they didn't do that the whole game they had some three down looks against georgia they had four down four a true four two five type of things where they had their you know, their rover in the game who was kind of like a high their rover was more of a hybrid linebacker safety than than what Notre Dame's rover has been so far, but uh, yeah, I mean, we we could see that, but again, I don't I don't know if that's the answer because again, they're still going to throw the ball. It's not like they're you know where the the comparisons end compared to Navy is is the throwing game. Yeah. They are a traditional right. passing offense. You know when they when they want to throw, they have traditional pass attack. Was what I mean by traditional right. passing offense, meaning their pass schemes are you know pro style traditional yeah. type of things. Play so, action, yeah, right. yeah. You you put too many of those guys in the field, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, now who's going to cover Jake Ferguson? Is it going to be Bo Bauer? That's not a matchup I love. Is it no. going to be Drew White? That's a little better matchup, but there's a size disadvantage there. Uh, you know, so I I just don't know if if. And and then if you you know you, you you do that say okay now Wisconsin can just spread you out you know put a they can I mean they they'll do things where they'll put their running back outside and 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 throw him the ball we've seen that we had some Jack Comb clips this year where we were breaking down that seam route he threw to Minnesota where he they motion the back all the way outside and you have to bump out and it creates an inside ISO where they've got a matchup where they've got their slot receiver up against a linebacker and throw it over the top for a fifty yard touchdown I mean right. You, you, you have to be careful with that. So, are there times we could see Bo Bauer and and Ch and uh, and Drew White? Sure. Is it something that I would want to make a living off of in this game? No, it's it's not. Crazy like a Fosky. I still love that name. Uh, if someone offered you a year's supply of Built Bars for a correct regular season win loss prediction, would y'all stick with your season predictions today, or would it be different? Well, that's a good question. I think I said eleven and one at mm -hmm. the beginning of the year. I'm sticking with my eleven and one. I'm sticking with it. I don't feel great about twelve and zero right now. I don't know how anyone. I don't know how a reasonable, objective person can look at how they've played so far and, and be like, "Oh, they're they're going to keep yeah. winning." Uh, no problem. <laughs> can they still win all their games? Absolutely. Yeah. Am I less confident about that today than I was when we made the twelve and zero prediction? Yeah, and it's it's you you know why. It's the offensive line, hundred percent, and and whether or not that unit's going to get coached. I mean, um, that that's my big concern. And and you know, I I, I hope that me giving Jeff Quinn more credit this off season than than maybe I should have comes back to be right. But so far, it has not looked good. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to change my prediction because I don't like to get into that emotional like, okay, we've got a small sample size. Let's just start over from scratch. Um, I made my prediction. It is what it is. I'm not going to go away from it yet until they lose a game. I can't, you know, I can't go away from it. What I would say to you is if you, I would feel a lot better about asking the answering that question in uh, Sunday or <laughs> in the post game show, right? Like, let me see how they handle Wisconsin because this is the kind of the, the point in the season where you start to see, okay, who is this team going to be? You know, 20, yeah. we talked about 2018, 19, 20, and 21. You know, we, we really didn't see that the first three games, they didn't look good. You know, game four against uh, in, in 2018 for Notre Dame was against, uh, trying to remember who, uh, I'm trying to go to that now. Uh, game four was Wake Forest, right? And they went on the road and beat Wake Forest pretty good. And then that team kind of started to take off. In, in 2019, 
you know, game four was against Virginia. Okay, we started to see that team break out a little bit. And then, you know, last year in two, in, 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 in 2020, game four was Louisville. So, okay, that wasn't good. But then game five, they went on the road against Pitt and kind of broke out. And, and to me, that was more like a traditional game four because there was that weird pause in the middle of the season or in the middle of that, that stretch that, that just kind of made it. It almost seemed like you were starting over again. And, you know, so I, I just need to see one more game before I really am ready to say, okay, this team isn't what I thought it would be. You know, I'm just, I'm not quite ready to yeah. jump that, that far. Yep. In my opinion. Timothy D is the lack of success recruiting the highest ranked offensive line due to the performance of this year's offensive line, or is it more due to Quinn's apparent lack of development? I don't know that things have changed a whole lot from a recruiting standpoint since the season started. This was off season stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they were missing on those guys long yeah, before that happened. Right, exactly. So I don't, so specific to this question, um, it has nothing to do with this year's performance. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it has to do with, previous years but not this year yeah i i don't and i don't even think it's necessarily lack of development he doesn't this is what we've been saying he does not have the reputation that harry Heastan had and that's right. not necessarily a knock on him because he's a relatively unknown in the the big boy circles right i mean this is his first not you know power five o-line coaching job you know he'd only co he was a head coach of buffalo before he came to notre dame he was the offensive line coach and offensive coordinator Cincinnati before that, then Central Michigan, then Grand Valley State. So sure. obviously he doesn't have Harry Heastan's resume. Harry Heastan coached in a Super Bowl when Jeff Quinn was in, you know, year three at Central Michigan. You know what I mean? So I I think that's been part of it. But I I, I think it has more to do with his, his ability as a recruiter to close. I think that's an issue as well. I mean, look. The problems with Billy Schreiber, and people say, well, you know, what do you mean they're not closing on top highest ranked guys? Well, look, Blake Fisher was going to Notre Dame. I don't care who the O-line coach was. They would have had to screw it up not to get Rocco Spindler. He did a great job on Tosh Baker. They got on Tosh Baker before Tosh became a big-time recruit. But other than that, there's been a whole lot more misses than there's been hits at recruiting yeah. on the offensive line. Yep. They came up woefully short in 2020. They only signed two offensive linemen. They missed out on a bunch of guys last year, and they had to settle for guys like – I mean, Caleb Johnson was a guy flat out that Notre Dame did not push for early on. They he, they brushed him off, and that's why he committed to Auburn. Then they had a bunch of misses, and they went back to him. That's not saying that Caleb Johnson is not a good football player, but the fact is, is he was not considered a top lineman. Neither was Michael Carmody. Yeah. Remember, they didn't go off Michael Carmody – go to Michael Carmody until they had missed on a bunch of other dudes. Pat Coogan, to me, was a guy that they were taking because they had a bunch of other misses. We're seeing the same thing this year. Where yes, they got Ashton. You know, they got Ashton Craig, who's an in-state kid. They got Joey Tanone, who's an in-state kid. Ty Chan was kind of always. I mean, that would you'd have had to screw that one up not to get Ty Chan. Yeah. Then you look at Jake Taylor. They get beat for, and just the list goes on and on and on and on. And, and none of those three guys we mentioned are right now are considered elite linemen. They're all good players with with upside, but none of them are elite linemen. So. It, it, there's a lot of people unwilling to admit that there is even a recruiting problem in the offensive line, but there is. Yeah. But that started long before the, the the current development issues we're seeing. But part of it is because other line coaches have seen what Notre Dame has put on the field in the recent years, and they know that it's not what Harry Heastan did. And, and I don't think the draft helped a ton either. I mean, they had a couple second-round picks and a third-round pick, but Notre Dame had been putting guys in the top 15. And we didn't see that, obviously, in this most recent draft class. Domer Grizz has an interesting uh, scenario here. He says, uh, BK was wrong to compare UW, UW to Navy. Should be 2020 Notre Dame. Ball control, big boy football with good old line, but not dynamic wide receivers. We need to treat them like Bama treated us in the Rose Bowl. But can we? I think you're missing the point of what he was comparing them to. It was about ball possession. I mean, right. I mean, that's what that's why the comparison happened. It wasn't really more than that. Right. He wasn't comparing game plan. He wasn't comparing right. anything like that. He was talking about Wisconsin likes to control the football. They do. That's not really a debate. I mean, they like to control the ball. Um, just like Navy does. Na Navy's goal is to limit possessions. Yeah. Right. Wisconsin's yep. objective is to limit possessions. That's just 
kind of part of the deal. So yeah, uh, I think you're, you're taking it a here. little bit further than Brian Kelly meant that comparison to be. Um, I understand. Now, if you just take away he was wrong and just say, you know, hey, this is who Wisconsin is and we should treat him like Bama treated us, sure, okay, I get that. I don't disagree yeah. with that. Right. Uh, I just don't think those two things necessarily go together. I think your observation about how they should treat, you know, like how Bama treated them – makes a ton of sense. I don't disagree with that at all. And that's kind of what we've talked about is you want to make them, you want to make them try to beat you throwing the ball. Cause if you yeah. do that, you're going to have success. Tommy guns. He says, if we're going to a four, three defense, <laughs> I'd like to see Bauer JD and Batelho. That could be exciting in a game like this. Wouldn't shock me if we do see something like that. Although yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, I think people need to not keep we always do this, right? Every time they play a good team. Hey, more Bo Bauer, less Drew White. Oh, no, Bo Bauer's not better than Drew White. Otherwise, he'd be starting. There's two coordinators that everybody here loves that have felt the same way, right? Yeah. Clark Lee and Marcus Freeman both feel that way, right? And so he's not better. And just because he's bigger doesn't mean he'd be more effective in this type of situation. Right. So I'd like to see whoever the mic is, J.D. and Patelho. And I honestly, Tommy, won't be shocked if we see that. D Rock has a question. Any numbers or stats on how many people viewed the Peacock streaming for the Notre Dame Toledo game? Thanks. And this is interesting because uh, Sean Styers and I, we do uh, an evening radio program every Friday, and we talked about this last Friday. And it's very interesting that Peacock, to our knowledge, has not released any numbers when it comes to views on Peacock. Whereas any other game, you've got overnight ratings, you've got you know, you got all kinds of ratings at your fingertips. Peacock didn't release anything. Yeah. So think and about I'm that. I'm looking through second. now, and I'm trying to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I know a lot of Notre Dame fans who said they have yet to watch the Toledo game. Sure, and I get it. And I don't think the ratings were very good. Otherwise, come on. If if the ratings were really good, don't you think Peacock would be out, you know, with their chest out, being oh, like, "Yeah, hey, this that, is great." Notre Dame would have put that out. Oh, because you know Notre Dame loves to pump, pump their, you know, puff sure. up their, you know, puff out their chest a little bit. Absolutely, uh, they absolutely would. So have. the fact that it's been yes. crickets tells me that the ratings were terrible. But that's just me reading into it. I haven't seen anything. It is interesting, Vince. I never really thought of it like that. But yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. They uh they haven't said a thing about it. Right. And that that, that I don't think that's good news. I mean, no. you know what I mean? I think they're trying to sweep it under the rug, to be honest with you. So maybe we'll get a few more years without it. Um, we'll see. Hope so. Domer Grizz, my fear on D is the Wisconsin offensive line wears us down and we start missing tackles and lanes in the fourth quarter. Do we have the depth to prevent this? Early third down success will be the key and a fast start on offense. They have the depth. Yeah. I, I mean, if, if, if for some reason we don't see Kurt Heinish tomorrow, that hurts the depth a little bit, but you know, they still have Aiden Keanu Anna that we haven't seen. They have Gabriel Rubio, who I believe is getting healthier. They have guys they can go to Jacob Lacey could take up more snaps. Sure. But is that a concern? That's always a concern when you play Wisconsin. It's always concerned that they're able to just lean on you and lean on you and lean right. on you, and then by and the fourth quarter you wear down. I don't care how deep you are. I mean, that's why you need that lead? You right. need you need a comfortable lead right. going into the fourth quarter. And to his point about starting fast on offense, I don't think third down success is the key. I think first down success is the key because first down success will lead to third down success. If they're in third and short all day, you're in trouble. You know, you're going to be in trouble. I, you know, yeah. yes. Now you need to get off the field on third down, but to me, that's going to be more about first down success than it will be third down success. That was one of your keys to the game, by the way. It was. People should go check that out. It's another video. Uh, Terry Howie says, Tommy Tremble off to a nice start with the Panthers. They played last night, I do believe, but I yep. I missed it to watch 14-year-olds He ran play. a little jet sweep for a touchdown. Really? Yeah, and had a nice. catch for 30 yards, too. I didn't watch the game, but I saw the stats afterwards. And then I saw the jet sweep I saw on Twitter last night, which I thought okay. was funny. Like, oh, the Carolina Panthers think, he, think he's worthy of designing plays for, but the Notre Dame football team that <laughs> he's a blocker. You know, last he's year a... didn't think he was worthy of doing anything other than blocking. So I just He's a blocker. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, let's see. Sparkling Swan says, do you think this is this next stretch of games are the most challenging under the BK era, Wisconsin, Cincinnati, Virginia Tech, USC. You might as well add North Carolina in there as well. Um, 
right? No, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I think you definitely need to add North Carolina. I mean, North Carolina is probably better than at least one of those teams, maybe right. two. Right. Um, but I, I, I'd say no. I, I'd say no. I, I think when you look at okay, so let's look back at at 2012. Yeah, you're at Michigan State. Then you had your home against Michigan to finish at your ranked home against Miami, or you had a neutral site game in Chicago against Miami, right? Uh, that was a Miami team that went to a bowl game that year, right? They went blew seven the doors and, off of them. No, they didn't go to a bowl mistaken. game. Were they on probation? They went seven and twelve, seven and five. Didn't go to a bowl game that year. Uh, maybe they fired their coach or something. I don't know. Then you had top ten Stanford. Then you had BYU that year at home, and then after that you were at Oklahoma, and BYU won eight games that year. With all due respect to you know, I, I don't know if any of those teams are as good as Oklahoma. They're, none of those teams, none of these teams are as good as Stanford was in 2012. None of agreed. Them. None, none of them, them are as good as Oklahoma was in 2012. I would either. argue you are correct on that. I think yeah. that one's probably a little bit more debatable, but, but sure. not not. I wouldn't I wouldn't debate you very long. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I'll hear what you have to say. Fair <laughs> enough. You're wrong. Debate over. Uh, you know. So it, no, I, I'd say no. And then I mean, there's been other years. I think 2017, Vince, I look at that 2017 schedule. You had a stretch of Georgia, BC, at Michigan State, who won 10 games. And you had a little blip in between Miami and North Carolina. But then you had USC, who won 11 games. NC State, who won nine games, had four defensive linemen that got drafted in the NFL draft. I remember that game. Yeah. Uh, then you played an eight-win Wake Forest team. Then you played at Miami, who was a top-10 team. Then you played home against Navy, who, uh, who was a, a seven-win team that year. And then you played at Stanford. So, uh, you know, to me, that was before Stanford really took a dive. That was a nine-win Stanford team. So, right. I, I, you know, I think this stretch can be put on par with some of those stretches. I don't think that I'm comfortable saying yet that it will be the toughest stretch. And part of that, too, is just we don't know. Uh, part of that is, is let's see how these teams are. I mean, do we really know how good Wisconsin is yet? Do we really know how good Virginia Tech is yet or USC? USC just fired their coach. And this is just as big of a game for Wisconsin as it is for right. Notre Dame. I mean, I, we, I, right. You're exactly right. We have a lot to learn about all these teams, and sure. we have a lot to learn about Notre Dame. So, absolutely, uh, it's certainly in the conversation. But I, I just don't know if I think it, the bookends on either end of the five game stretch mm -hmm. are less than those other years. You know what I mean? Like, first three aren't that hard, right? Then you get the the last four aren't. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I think. I just feel like the, the the bookends aren't as difficult. It's a tough yeah. stretch in the in the middle, but the both ends. I mean, if they can get through the stretch, that I the rest of the season doesn't worry me. You know? Yeah, it, it, you you'd have to have like a complete meltdown at yeah. that point in time, for, right? Or just a know. rash of injuries, right. or I right. mean, just something crazy. Yeah, I'm looking at some of these other stretches throughout periods, and and I mean, yeah, this is a this is a tough stretch. If these teams are as good as everybody says they are, yeah, it's going to be yeah. a pretty rough stretch. Right. But I don't know if we if I necessarily can say that, but it's certainly in the conversation. It's certainly in the conversation. AJ, I think Notre Dame is going to need a defensive or special teams touchdown to pull this one out. We have seen one Tyree kick return in three games. It would be great if the staff gave him a chance tomorrow. Imagine that. I will say that he hasn't been given a whole lot of opportunities because they've been kicking it into the end zone. And you, you're, I'm sorry, you're foolish to bring it out five yards into the end zone right now because you need a minimum of a 30-yard return in order to break even for a touchback. Mm -hmm. It's not like the old days. You know what I mean? Like I just don't see that being the case. Um, now, if they're consistently kicking it inside the 10 – then I'm going to be upset that they're not allowing him to return. Well, that's part of the reason they put it out to the 25. It's just in hopes of trying to deter you from returning it. I mean, Correct. that's that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to make rules to where you don't yes. return as much. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm I if you're if you're catching it a foot into their end zone, I'm uh, with Chris Tyree. I'm returning it three, four, five yards deep. You know, I remember that one kick return Clinton Johnson had back. I think it was against Stanford back in the day. He caught that thing like in the back half of the end zone. I think it ended up being like a 108-yard kick return or something, sure. something like that. But that's one of those ones kind of like that scene from uh, Major League. I told you I'm in a movie mood today <laughs> where where Willie uh, – Major League 2 where 
uh, Omar Epps, Willie Mays Hayes catches that ball like with his hat or something. Or maybe it was first. He goes, "Nice catch, Hayes. Don't ever effing do it again." You know, it's kind of like one of those things. Like, <laughs> right, nice return, Clint. Don't ever freaking do that again. You know, exactly. Uh, exactly. It's not something you make a living of. But to your point, that's what makes the times they have had opportunities and they just. Yeah, that's so frustrating. frustrating. But look, that is frustrating. AJ, I, I I used to do that a lot, and I still do sometimes more than I'd like, where I say, you know, if, 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 and I made that mistake last week. At this point in time, it's like, yeah, if they did that, it'd be nice. But at this point in time, Brian Kelly's in year 12. He is who he is. If <laughs> if he's, you know, if he's having Brian Pulling call for fair catches with Chris Tyree against Toledo and Florida State yeah. at the 10-yard line, it's not going to change against Wisconsin. On a national spotlight game, if anything, it's gonna he's gonna be more prone. I'd love to be proven wrong. Be really great if I could prove me wrong, but I just sure. don't. Well, I, and I think you know, look, Kyron is returning punts. It's a good step forward. Okay, uh, when he has the opportunity, he's. I think he's done a good job of deciding when to return and when to fair catch up to this point. Mm-hmm. So I think clearly they're giving him the option. That's a good step in the right direction. Hopefully that bleeds over to kickoff returns. Mm-hmm. That's what I don't I'll think say. it will. I know. I'm trying yeah. to put a silver lining on the whole thing. Yeah, but. which I used to do, but now it's just yeah. kind of like, okay, now I'm like, I'm assuming it's not going to happen. After but I never thought that they would allow anybody to return punts, and they're doing yeah. that. that. That That's yeah. all I'll say. Part of me wonders if that's not if that's not Kyron, because Kyron strikes me the kind of kid that sometimes he's just going to be like, yeah, I know you told me you care fair catch, but I don't give a crap. What are you going to do, bench me? <laughs> yeah, you know what right. I mean? Like He just strikes right. me, and I love that about him. So you know do I. Mean? I don't know if that's true or not. That's well, just me. Just, he's picked good times to return it, those yeah. line drive punts yeah. and things like that. Yeah. That's when you return punts, man. We did get a super chat from John A1. John, Thanks, thank John. you for that super chat very much. Happy Friday, IB. Thanks for all the great content. You are welcome. Thanks, John. Uh, Joseph Salvatore says, do you guys think the offensive line has heard the chatter about how bad they've been? If I were one of those guys, that would fire me up for this game and rise to the challenge and prove everyone wrong. I, yeah, I don't they, see how they couldn't have heard according it. According to Josh Slug, I mean, we had an article at Irish Breakdown where he talked about like, hey, we we hear what Sping said. I, I For me, I guess I just – I don't know if I would have cared, and it's hard for me to put myself there because we didn't have social media when I played. It was still like a decade plus yeah, away. Sure. But I just don't know. I, like Ian Book last year said that he just completely got rid of Twitter, and that's such a smart decision. Or just turn, you know, took it off of his phone. He didn't delete his account, but he took it off his phone or whatever. I, if I would, I would do that with all. Hey guys, get off or do what Liam Eikenberg did. Protect your tweets, right? Don't don't let people privately DM you and then don't care what anybody else thinks. But yeah. th- I know for a fact they've heard it because they've talked about it. Mm-hmm. Just like last week they heard all the noise about what people were saying about Marcus Freeman because they talked about it right after the game. Yeah. You know? And so, yeah, they, they've, they, they're they definitely aware of it. Here we go. Mr. Hughtown. Wisconsin will play tough, but I don't think they are that good. Middle of the pack, Big Ten power rankings. We can roll – if we are honed in, look, that's what Brian's been saying all along. I mean, if, if, if Notre Dame plays the game that they can play, I, I, I could, I would not in any way be surprised if Notre Dame rolls in this, I would be flabbergasted and shocked if it's the other way around and Wisconsin rolls Notre Dame with a big score. And I, I'm just going to throw up Andrews here. He said the most cracked I read was 41, seven Wisconsin. Who's, who did that? Was that some fan or was that like an actual like, website? I'm don't, curious. I'm Really curious to who put that out. So you like, stay at the bottom and see if you can see when yeah. that happens because please throw that up because I would love to meet the person and have a conversation with them. Like, What film are you watching that you see 41-7? 41 points yeah. out of Wisconsin would be unbelievable. I'm sorry. That would be unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So, and shocking. Like yes. that, would, that would be the worst loss of the Brian Kelly tenure. I'd be oh, worse than Miami. Yeah. Worse than Miami in, 20, in, in 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Worse than Michigan in 2019. That Absolutely. would be awful. It would be a horrible drive home. I might just. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Keith Sellner, the only thing I watch on ESPN are live games. Me too. I yeah, that's pretty much where else. I'm at now. Yeah. Uh, uh, and if they come out with a new 30 for 30. Yeah. I'll watch that. Yeah. The, that's yeah. about the only thing they do well, in my opinion. Those two Absolutely. Things. Live games and 30 for 30s. Yeah. Mike S. Simple recipe. O line holds its own. Haven't shown that they will. ND wins going away. Also, if no improvement in the line this year, who will be the next O line coach next season? Well, we don't Jeff like to Quinn. Really speculate. It's going to be Jeff Quinn. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. The fifth horseman. 
do we have the personnel to run a 5-2-D against Wisconsin? And do you think we will see that tomorrow? No, they don't. They have the personnel to do it. I don't think they should do it. I mean, and when you say 5-2, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about three interior players, like a nose, 2-D tackles, and then two outside linebackers like we saw you know, Lou Holtz ran a 5-2. 1988, they ran a 5-2, basically a 5-2 defense. It was called a 3-4, but it was like it was like a more yeah. of a 5-2. Um, no, I don't think that would be the answer. Because again, Wisconsin will throw on you if you if you overplay the run. I mean, that that's the whole thing. I mean, I don't know if I would necessarily say that you know, Graham Mertz has proven that he's gonna scare you, but he's a talented kid. Sure. And and I'm not gonna sit there and say I'm going to I'm going to dare you to throw so much that we're going to you know we're going to do this because you know again they they have I mean look Jack Cohn in, in 2019 had a 400 yard game against Central Michigan you know threw for 280 on the road against Minnesota cuz Minnesota was basically daring him to throw so he took some big shots down the field you know Iowa tried to do that a little bit he only had 173 yards but Late later in that game, Iowa was playing aggressive. He had he had two downfield shots that proved impactful in that game. So they they will take some shots. They will throw on you if you don't if you don't respect that and if you try to overplay the run game. I, I am all for trying to force them to throw the ball. I, I just sure. don't want to do it in a way where all of a sudden we've got even uh, from a defensive standpoint, you see Notre Dame with even less personnel prepared to to play those guys. I, I don't. I don't think so. And I don't think that's necessary to be right. honest. With and you're not going to see a five, two. You'll see them bring five. No, three, four, yeah, you know, sure, sure. But that's a different personnel grouping in my opinion. Right. No question. Uh, OP dragon 19. Any word on Heinish? Basically, Brian Kelly just said he's a game time decision. Yeah. That, I mean, bottom line, that's what he said. I, so I mean, look, there's, there's a reason we can't comment on this, but I, I have, I, I, there's a reason I haven't pushed back on the rumors that are out there. It's almost a. Okay. I know none of the rumors. Here we go. Sloney says, is this the week the O-line play gets cleaned up and all the parts come together? No, I don't think all the parts are going to I come hope together. so. Could they play better? Yes, but I'm not expecting, wow, where did this team come from? See, I, I think that's exactly what's going to happen, though, Vince, whenever it happens. Okay. I don't know if it's going to be this game. I think there's going to be a game where it just it, they finally it clicks. I hope you're and right. And they're just going to play great. I, I, again, I, I have no no hope that it's going to be this game. Or no, no, not no hope. I have no expectation that it's going to be this game. I'm not going to, you know, sun, uh, shove sh sunshine up your you-know-what and say, oh, it's going to be this game. I hope it is, but I, I'm not – I don't know when it's going to come. But there's going to come a game this year and hopefully soon where they figure it out and just it clicks and they play great. Uh, hope, hopefully it's this game. Be nice because then I'll feel a whole lot better about the next five. But I, I'm not predicting it. Yeah, this game. But I, I, is this the week? I, I have no idea. I hope so, but I have no idea. Jacob Steely says Brian and Vince would a would a loss be a good thing for Brian Kelly? Like a bad loss, an uncompetitive game of sorts. A guy like Saban rips his team after a 40 point win. BK sim seems simply content getting his 10 a year. Uh, no, getting blown out is never a good thing. Uh, no. I do not think it would be good. And we've seen this team get blown out before they, under Brian Kelly, and nothing changes. I mean, he doesn't right. rip into his team. He doesn't make drastic changes. Like It's not going to change anything. You're just going to have a really disappointing loss to talk right. about. I, so, no, I do I mean, not think we, it we, we saw it in 2014. There weren't really any changes after 2014, and that team lost – you know, five of their last seven games and, you know, got blown out by Arizona State and had an embarrassing loss to Northwestern, got destroyed by USC. And and he used every excuse in the book to say, hey, we're going to still bring Brian Van Gorder back. Yeah. You know, and then they that did. next year, you know, they go out and they go 10 and three and their defense fails them in every single big game they played in. And Brian, you know, gave up 38 points to Stanford, gave up 44 points to Ohio State. And Brian Kelly said, literally, this is what he said after the game. We just need to coach a little better and play a little harder. And they went out the next year and went four and eight. Yeah, we know what happened that next year. So the only time, look, the only time Brian Kelly's ever made changes like that are a when he had a coach that that challenged him, which we saw with the offensive coordinator after 2019, and then when he was forced to because they went four and eight. One loss doesn't affect Brian Kelly like that. I'm not saying I'm not saying that in a negative way. Like he doesn't care. I think Brian right. Kelly cares about losing. Brian Kelly doesn't like losing. 
Um, it's just that part of that's good. You don't necessarily want to overreact to just one loss. Uh, but sometimes like a, a loss, at all. <laughs> yeah, sometimes a reaction, a, a loss can be that, that, that is because of what you've seen in wins kind of, it, it, you lose the ability to justify that position. And maybe yeah. that forces a change and, you know, how they prepare. Maybe John McNulty gets, I don't know if John McNulty is capable of coaching the offensive line, uh, you know, more being more of all, I have no clue, but let's just say he was, or, you know, who, who knows what other kind of things are there, but listen, we could talk about this all day long. Brian Kelly is not doing anything about the offensive line from a coaching standpoint this season. Part of the reason he fired Brian Van Gorder during the 2016 season was a, if he didn't, Jack Swarbrick was going to. And two, Brian Van Gorder was disliked by his players, and there was going to be a mutiny on that football oh, yeah. team. Jeff Quinn that. is not disliked by his players. Right. I don't think they necessarily respect him a ton as a football coach. They do as a person, from what yes. I'm told. I've never yeah. heard any fo- any player or anyone associated with Notre Dame from a player standpoint say anything about Jeff Quinn as a person. It's always been good guy, light coach. He's a really nice guy, all this kind of stuff. I just don't think there's the same level of respect for him as a coach as there was for Harry. And that's just – but, look, we could we could do a whole show on offensive line, and it kind of seems like that's where this show is headed. We have a super <laughs> chat from Tony Stengel. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> With the struggles of the O-line, can Notre Dame use this in a positive way to recruit? You're the missing link here type thing. No, it doesn't work on the offensive line like that. Because they see what offensive linemen care about more than anything else, more than playing time, more any of that is our, our, is that guy coach those. You can watch. It's like it, if you go to a, look, you Vince. I'm, do you know a lot about the ballet? Oh, not really. Exactly. No. Okay, you could go to a ballet and just as, as a football coach and see the harmony and how every, the timing, sure. the delivery, and be like, "Wow, that was." I don't know what they did, but that was really cool. And then you could see one where they're like bumping into each other and they're falling down, and the timing. And you may not know a thing about the ballet, but you can look at that and say, "Yeah, that that wasn't good, right?" Well, that's kind of how offensive linemen look at the offensive lines. They don't care about oh the freshman starting or oh they lose four stars. I could play right away. It's yeah, they're not coached real well, and and that's that's a that's so much more important than any other position. And, and like for example, okay, here's a true story. I remember I, Liam Eikenberg w- was committed to Notre was being recruited by Notre Dame. He he was hadn't quite committed yet. I think I don't think or maybe he had just he had recently committed. But Urban Meyer went to Liam Eikenberg and said, "Hey, you're going to come here. You're going to start for us as a true freshman guard, and then eventually we're going to move you to tackle." Liam's response to that was, I don't want to play as a freshman. I'm not ready to play as a freshman. I'm going to go for a coach. He stayed, because Kerry he stand and convinced him, you come here, I'm going to coach you. I mean, he had laid out that path for Liam to get to the NFL. And it involved him coming for a year, learning behind, you know, the, the it would have been at the time he was a freshman in 2016. So it would have been behind like Mike McGlinchey and, you know, Steve Elmer. And, you know, at the, that, at the time, that's kind of who they thought was going to be there. He ended up leaving after 2015. Now, Alex Bars, you know, those kind of guys, right? You're going to learn, and then your time's going to come. Even though Ohio State, Urban Meyer, fresh off of a national championship, was convincing him he was going to come play as a freshman, Liam Meikenberg was like, uh-uh, because he he knew the plan of development that was there. That's so much – you try that on an off, on a receiver, and he's going to Ohio State. Mm-hmm. If Notre Dame would have told a receiver, you're going to come here, you're going to sit for a year, and then here's your plan, or, or you can go to Ohio State and play as a freshman, he's like – because it's a different breed. I, I keep telling people, it, offensive linemen are a different animal. Yeah, no doubt. And 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 it doesn't matter where you're from or anything. It just for the nine out of ten kids care more about the development aspect than they care about freshman playing time or any of that kind of stuff. Because right. part of the reason is the NFL still values experience for linemen. Mm-hmm. They don't care about experience for running backs or receivers. They care about how fast are you. You know you, that. Linemen, they care more about, okay, does this kid have the experience? Can he play? Right. You know, all those type of things. So, yeah, there you go. We have another Super Chats. I will just thank 82 Slice. I have to get rolling. Uh, so, Brian, I'm leaving you solo here. But thanks, everybody. I love Fridays. my favorite day of the week. Let's hope for some good news tomorrow, everybody. Just, you know, keep those positive vibes coming. And uh, hopefully – what well this time tomorrow it's going to be the middle of the second quarter maybe even halftime so uh yeah, we'll be close scary, to halftime so you'll be in really illinois scary. at the game 
really scary. But uh, anyway, I love my time on Fridays. Guys, I will see you guys tomorrow post-game. And uh, go Irish. All right, the super chat from uh, 82 Slice is, what defense did Notre Dame uh, or did Freeman run against Georgia last year with Cincinnati? Did they change anything up much? Might be indicative of what we see tomorrow. I, I think there's a little bit of a difference in that last year against against Georgia, they had different personnel. Uh, last week again, Vince. By the way, are you above twelve fifty four? I know you're still down there. Are you above twelve fifty four? Like while you're sitting there, can you bring? Because I'm at twelve fifty four. Can you put some questions up as I'm done with these? While you're you're eating your food before your next period starts, um, they did. Fo- so when 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 Cincinnati would when Georgia would go to twelve personnel, two one back, two tight ends, Cincinnati would would substitute an extra linebacker and take a DB out. When Georgia was in like more of a 11 personnel or more of a base personnel, 21 personnel, they'd be more in like a true 4-2, whereas the, usually they were in a three down line. They would put a fourth defensive lineman on the field, but they were still in their, their two inside backers and their rover. When Georgia went 12 personnel, they would take out one of their, I think their rover or one of their DBs, and they would put a third true linebacker on the field. And so there were definitely changes. They were like, you're not going to run on us. You're going to have to beat us throwing the ball. And Georgia was able to beat them throwing the ball. They threw, they only rushed for 40 some yards that game, but they threw for over 400 because they hit like, I think it was like four or five just bombs in that game, like big 40 plus yard shots. Uh, So we did see something different, but obviously Wisconsin doesn't have Georgia's playmakers, uh, clearly. All right, D-Rock says, even if the NCAA football simulation game had Notre Dame returning kicks and punts versus Wisconsin, oh, we won 24-14. Okay, those are always fun. Uh, Antoine Porsche Rideau, did you see Tommy Tremble for a touchdown on a tight jet sweep? Notre Dame 38-13. to I love your optimism, Antoine, and I did not watch the game live, but I did see – uh, I did see that last night on on uh, Twitter. That was pretty. That was pretty funny to watch. That uh, turned on the Jets, got outside and got in the end zone. I think it was like a seven yard touchdown run. Tony Stangle has a super chat. Let me pull this up here real quick. Um, a lot. Thank you for that, Tony. A lot of outlets saying Notre Dame is going to lose convincingly. Does Be- Kelly use that as motivation? And does Notre Dame play with a chip on their shoulder? He needs to look. That stuff works for football. I, now, d- does it work if you tell them that right before the game? No, but if if it's kind of built into your preparation throughout the week, yeah, you kind of just build that up all through the week. Like just tick them off. So by the time the game starts, they're fired up. If you try to use that right before the game, it's like no, you've missed that window. But yeah, I, I would hope he uses it for motivation. I think he does. We, based on comments we've heard from players after the games in the past, I think he does use that stuff for motivation. He won't say it to us, but what he says, and I don't care if he does says it to us. Lou Holtz always said the opposite of what he told players when he was here, but it's I care more about what he tells the players. AJ, a Chris Tyree kick return touchdown or breakout games from Austin and Lindsay with Gus Johnson on the call would be a perfect Saturday. That's the thing. So normally I turn sound off when I'm watching Notre Dame games. This will be the one week that I don't. I love listening to Gus Johnson call games. I, I can't wait to listen to him call the game. I hope that's why I hope it's an exciting game. Not but Notre Dame could win this game 17-13 and Gus could make it sound interesting. I mean, that's just how he is. He can make it sound interesting. I love listening to him call games. Like three yard gains, you'd think a guy's about to score a 50 yard touchdown. Antoine also asked AJ Kevin Austin. Um already had a breakout game versus Florida State. I want a breakout game from Lindsay and a kick return for Tyree. That'd be wonderful. Love seeing that. Love see that. Scott Yerbeck, any chance? How any chance? Uh, how is five star Dante Moore looking in recruiting? Go Irish. Look, Notre Dame's in this one. They're not alone. He's looking at Michigan very hard. There's other programs that he's looking at, but Notre Dame's in this one. I would if he has a top three and he hasn't announced it. I'd be willing to bet you twenty bucks that if he announced the top three tomorrow, Notre Dame would be in it. And and I I think again they've got to go out and continue to play well this season because as Vince and I have said all summer. How Notre Dame performs on offense this year is going to have a huge, huge impact on whether or not they can actually close on Dante Moore. But they're putting in the work. They're putting in the work. Rob says, I still can't believe the coaching staff thinks Madden is better than Spindler. The worst part is they don't even give him a chance to play. That's been the a very strange thing for me. Like I, I'm like part of me wonders, like, is he hurt? But then I then I find out no, he's not hurt. He's practicing. But how do you like run the whole spring with the first team and now you can't get on the field at all? And I know Kane Madden wasn't here in the spring and neither was Jarrett Patterson, but does that mean he's gone from like being first team to not getting a single snap in three games? Very confusing. Very, very confusing. It just it just doesn't make sense. 
Uh, have we seen Jack Kaiser play at will to spell Bertrand? Not yet. No. I'm. You know, not that I've noticed. How I'll say that. Not that I've noticed. And then AJ's response to Antoine, he says, Florida State was more of a preview of what Austin can do, in my opinion. I guess breakout game for me would be him taking the game over and dominating. I think that's a fair. I think I think both of those responses were 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 fair to how they've played. D Rock says called it yesterday. I'm sticking to it today. No wavering. Notre Dame 24, Wisconsin 20. That's close to I had 24 19. So we're in this, we're very, very much in the same ballpark. Rob goes left tackle Baker, left guard Spindler, center Patterson, right guard Christophic, right tackle Lug. I would still put Spindler to the right. I know that he's been playing left, but if I were to put them in the game, uh, I would put I'd put Spindler to the right just to get in between two veterans. I don't want two young guys playing side by side, but if they did that, okay, that's fine. Go with it. Uh, I would have no problem with that lineup right now. I, 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 now, I would still have Zeke Carell rotating in with Rocco Spindler, but I'd have no problem with that lineup right now. And then when Fisher comes back, left tackle Fisher, right tackle Baker everywhere somewhere else. But, yeah, if you're going to put Baker right tackle, you need to find a place for Josh Lug because Josh Lug's not going to the bench. Yes, he had a bad game against Purdue. He did, no question. But he was probably your best lineman in your first two games. You know, and you just – I know everybody's, like, ready to write him off, but I just I – don't, I don't see that. Ethan Bodner says, we need this to be a convincing win for national media because I'm sick of hearing that Notre Dame is overrated, even if some sort of it, some of it is warranted due to the offensive line. Look, Notre Dame can win this game by 24, and many people in the national media will simply say, oh, Wisconsin wasn't that good. Man, it's just – that's what they're, they're going to do. So just get used to that because it, it they, they're trying to get a response out of you like you're getting. Uh, but, yes, a convincing win would mean a lot from a lot of a – lot, in a lot of ways. And Rob has Wisconsin winning by a touchdown. That would that you know. Hopefully, we don't see that. All right, let's go to the next one. What do we got here? Uh, Andrew Goss, O line has to play okay to win. Wisconsin's has to play good. Yes, agree. Wisconsin's line has to play really well for them to win. Notre Dame's needs to just not suck. That's I mean that's that's essentially where they're at with this at this point in time. Vince, Vince, what y'all don't see is in our in our thing. I can. There's the two like uh, the two of us are in the bottom, and it kind of like who's like waiting in the room. Vince is still there pulling up questions, and apparently he thought that was really funny. So, all right, do you got any more questions, Vince, or did you get kicked? You got kicked. Okay, I'm at uh, twelve fifty nine. So we'll go ahead and get this uh, get this one going. Anthony Solomon says this team could win a title, but it will need some breaks along the way. The offensive line leaves a thin margin for error. I, I'm not in the title conversation right now until I see this line play better. Once this line starts playing better and we can get a better read for what this team is with a good offensive line, then I'll feel a little bit more comfortable getting back to that. But just hypothetically, this should have been a season where Notre Dame, because again, look around at Clemson's down, Ohio State's down, Bama's not as good as they were last year, Georgia's good but flawed. I mean, there's not Oklahoma's not what they have been in some past years. This would have been a year where you should have been able to put it all together, and so far they haven't because of the offensive line. Ethan Bodner also says it's just so frustrating because if the O-line would just play average, we would blow the rails off teams. Agree, because we finally have a great pass game, but beyond bad run game due to O-line needs to be better. Agree with you completely. Caleb Collins says, I know some people laughed, but I can really see this game being like Bama versus Notre Dame, and we're, uh, we are going to be Bama in this game, speed on outside and forcing Mertz to beat us. Um, again, Bama's offensive line played a whole lot better than what Notre Dame's offensive line has played so far. But if the offensive line plays good football, I, I don't. I, I would agree with you. I, just, I don't know if we – I mean, Bama won the Joe Moore Award last year. They had one of the three best lines in the country, even without – their starting center in the game last year, they still had one of the best, the best in the country. William Perry says, I like how they're using Buckner. Got to keep him confident. No reason to rush him. I agree. Paul Lazat says, has the coaching of Jeff Quinn been brought up enough during Brian Kelly's press conferences? I feel like more should be asked about the coach's performance, not just the players. Uh, 
honestly, I don't really watch a ton of his press conference at the time. I just kind of go to his answers. The ones I see, no, he's not getting asked a lot of tough questions about the offensive line. But look, I, I and like there's some some people down there taking shots at reporters. Look, here's the deal. I, I've explained this before. What do you think he's going to say? So if you're a reporter, you're in a situation where you can say, okay, I can ask them this tough question, knowing he's not going to answer it, knowing he's going to get pissed off, knowing there's a chance that Notre Dame is going to you know, potentially could hurt, you know, hinder our access, knowing that as an institution, they're already pulling back access from the media. And you could you could get into that pissing match if you want, knowing he's not going to answer the question. Brian Kelly's not going to criticize Jeff Quinn publicly. He's not. He's not going to criticize Tommy Reese or – or Mike Elston, and, and now some of those coaches don't deserve to be criticized, but he's just not going to do that. Right or wrong, he's not going to do that. You could ask, Tim Priester could ask him, I could ask, he's not going to answer those questions. And all he's going to do is deflect, and all he's going to do is then go at the reporter and, and talk about, you know, the team's record and what they've been the last however many years. And, you know, the fact that, oh, they were Joe Moore Award finalists and make some excuses about they're young and all this other kind of stuff. And there's enough people on the beat that kind of parrot and promote that stuff that when somebody like a Tim Priester or a Tim O'Malley, or if I if, if I was at a press conference asking them questions, which I don't, because it's, it's just to me, it's honestly, it's just I have Mike do that now because it's like I already know what Brian Kelly's going to say. So it's just what what what's what good is there? Because then what happens is is the 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 clowns on Twitter just go at them and and criticize them and all that kind of stuff. And some people care about that. I don't. So it just, you can get mad at reporters all you want. And some of them annoy me, but you know, if you're a guy like Tim Priester, you've got a story to do, right? If you're a guy like Tim O'Malley, if you're, when Lou Samoji was around, you know, Lou and I would have conversations like this. We, you know, I, it, and I learned a lot working with Lou because he would explain to me, okay, yes, I could ask him that question or you can ask him that question, but you already know what he's going to say. And you're not going to have a story to write unless you want to make it a sensational story about your argument with Brian Kelly. And then that is sort of, you know, you know, you picked a fight so that you could make yourself the center of the story. We're not supposed to be the focus of the story. The Notre Dame football team is. And so you can either ask him that question, knowing you're not going to get answered, knowing you're not going to have content to write about, or you can ask a different question or ask a question in a different way where he will actually answer it. And, you know, and then you have a story to write. So I get the frustration. I do. Um, but I mean, you know, already, Brian Kelly is going to say whatever he's going to say, no matter what we ask him about it or not. He just, he just is. And I know that's frustrating for you all. I, I, I get it, but it's not about having, you know, stones or guts or anything like that. It's, it's a business decision that people have to make. And, and I, and for, you know, some of the people that, that choose not to do that, I respect it for the people that choose not to do that, but then choose to go the opposite direction. And, you know, uh, puff up and make claims that we all know are not true and just parrot what Brian Kelly says and, and have no, like no desire to like push back at all that I don't have any respect for. Craig Sebring on third and long. Do you think Notre Dame blitzes a lot? I, I wouldn't on third and long. I would just rush your four and drop seven. Don't let them run it. Cause they'll, they'll on third and long, they'll screen, they'll run screens. And if you blitz, they can catch you in a screen and, and hurt you. I think to me that is that is the the bigger concern. Antoine says they need to kick Patterson out the left tackle until Fisher comes back, give Spindler a shot at left guard, and move the kid who replaced Patterson at center last year. Can't think of his name, Zeke Carell. Look, here's the problem: if you're going to move Z Jarrett Patterson to left tackle, then you need to leave him there. You can't be switching centers like multiple times throughout the season. That's a position that needs continuity. So I understand the desire to put t uh, Jarrett Patterson out at left tackle, but I don't think that makes your team better, in my opinion. Now, now that we're in the season, if you were going to make that move, it should have been in the offseason. But now that, that you're here, I just – especially if your plan, like you said, Antoine, is to then move him back to center when when Fisher comes back, I, I don't I don't think that would be a great – in my opinion, a great idea. Jared Hardigan says, Coach, after the past few games, I'm pretty worried about this upcoming one with Wisconsin. Honestly, I think our D will play lights out, but we are going to get thrashed on the offensive line thoughts. I, I get those fears. I mean, I just feel like they got thrashed against Wisconsin and we're still able to rip off you know, some big plays, and I think that they should be able to do the same against Wisconsin. But, look, I predicted them to score 24 points on Wisconsin. I, I don't have a great deal of 
of optimism that they're just going to all of a sudden put it all together. I hope they do. I think they're capable of it if they do. And I hate the negativity that's coming out of this podcast today, but it's, it's based on what we've seen. I mean, this offensive line has gotten whipped by three defenses that aren't close to being as good as Wisconsin's. That's concerning, but I still think Notre Dame is, is good enough to win because of what you said also is I think that if the D plays lights out, Notre Dame will win this game. Corey D says, despite our limitations with the offensive line, Reese needs to be creative with his play calling. Let's see more jet sweeps, halfback screens. Further, we need to take deep shots. I love uh, that we're underdogs. Look, I, I understand what you're saying. Number one, you keep saying this. This is like the third or fourth time that you've talked about deep shots. Notre Dame has already taken about as many deep shots in, in three games as we saw most of last season. I, I don't know where this constant thing about they need to take more deep I mean, did you not watch last week's game? He threw like five deep shots to Kevin Austin. He threw a deep shot over the middle to Joe Wilkins. He threw a deep ball to Braden Lindsay that he dropped for a touchdown. And he threw a deep ball to a Avery Davis that went for a touchdown. And I could point out similar things against Toledo and similar things. They took seven shots against Florida State that went 20 yards or more past line of scrimmage. I don't know how many more deep shots you want them to take. Uh, when you say about being more creative, yeah, okay, jet sweeps and half, you know, halfback screens. First of all, the running backs combined have caught about a third of Notre Dame's passes this year. I, I, I have no problem with how they're using the running backs. Jet sweeps are fine, but look, you got to look at how they're playing Notre Dame. Teams are playing Notre Dame tight with their coverages. If you're playing tight coverages, jet sweeps don't work as well. They just don't. And you can say, you know, with despite the limit, look, limitations of the offensive line cripple everything. There is no magic bullet. There is no creativity against a team like Wisconsin that's going to negate your offensive line playing bad. This is plain and simple going to come down to the offensive line has to play better. If they play better, Tommy Reese will have more tricks up a sleeve, more things he can pull from. But there is there, there there's just not nothing you're going to do when the offensive line's not playing well. You're you're not alone. You're not alone. Joseph Salvatore says, if Quinn Carroll stayed healthy, would he be part of the starting line and would the line be better? He was high, a highly recruited prospect. I think he'd have a chance. Yeah, I mean, if, if Quinn Carroll was healthy and never got hurt, maybe they don't feel the need to go get Kane Madden. That's possible. Would the line be any better? No, because he was a kid that was not a super athlete even before the injury he would have needed to be technically sound. And I don't think this offensive line is technically sound. That's the problem. Corey D says, do you think Kelly and Quinn are aware of the criticisms aimed at them or are the, they just ignorant and oblivious? Kelly's stubbornness is exasperating considering how close we are to an elite status. Uh, he's very aware of that, which is why he says the thing. You wonder, like, why does Brian Kelly say these things that we all know just to be absurd about the offensive line? Like, the offensive line played really well against Purdue. No, they didn't, and he knows they didn't. But he also knows if he says that, there's going to be enough people that cover the team that are going to run with that, that it's going to make – people like me look negative. Well, well, you keep talking about the offensive line. Brian Kelly said it looked good. So-and-so from the local paper said that it looks good. So why are, why are you so critical all the time? You're just negative. You know, oh, okay, fine. If you want to believe everything Brian Kelly says, that's on you. But that's why he says it, because he knows people are going to report it and report it as fact. Brian Kelly said it, therefore it must be the truth. But if he didn't hear the criticism, he wouldn't be talking about it as much is what I wanted to finish with. AJ says, excited for Fox tomorrow with Gus and Klatt. Saturday night football isn't the same since Fowler took over. Agree completely. I think his terrible big game voice, don't disagree at all. Gus, Nestler, and McDonough are better in my opinion. There's a lot of people better, uh, would be better for that job than Chris Fowler, in my opinion, a lot. But they don't have the name recognition that Chris Fowler did. Uh, Corey D says, Gus and Klatt hate Notre Dame. No, they don't. No, they don't. Come on, Corey. I, you're kind of in a rare mood today. You're a little fired up. Come on. I've listened. No, 
dude, stop. Come on, buddy. They don't hate Notre Dame. Florida Irishman says football is about matchups. Very good insight. I agree with that. Wisconsin doesn't match up at all. Not enough athletes. Notre Dame should win going away. See, if if Notre Dame's line play was better, I would agree with you. And this is what we said during the se- during the offseason, why I, Wisconsin was in the game I was worried about. Notre Dame matches up well with them in the trenches on defense. If Notre Dame was coached well on offense, I would say that the offensive line matches up well with Wisconsin to the point where they could at least stalemate. And a Notre Dame offensive line stalemating and just doing a good job against Wisconsin up front then leads to what you said, which is the athletes on the perimeter. But the problem is, is that the Notre Dame has had an, an athlete advantage over Purdue. They had an athlete advantage over Toledo. They had an athlete advantage over Florida State. And they weren't necessarily convincing in those wins because that was all negated by the offensive line. And to your point, it, it is about matchups. And Notre Dame does match up on the skill. But you can't talk about that and just ignore the fact that Wisconsin's front seven has been very good this season and Notre Dame's front five has been very bad this season. That's part of the matchups that have to be taken into consideration. That's why we say if if the Notre Dame offensive line just plays solid football on Saturday, I do think Notre Dame can win going away. There's, there's no doubt in my mind, but I just need to see it. That's the big thing. Curtis Hewitt says, what's up, IB Nation? It's been a while. Go Irish. Glad to have you back, Curtis. Preston says, how many 2022 recruits is Notre Dame looking to add, and does Notre Dame currently lead for any 2022 recruits? Uh, they want at least – they want at least five more, and I'm curious to kind of see how this expanded – um, recruiting class thing is is going to play out. Some people have brought that up and they said, you know, could this mean Notre Dame could add a bunch more kids? No, because Notre Dame's issue wasn't 25 because the way 25 works is you can put some kids towards the previous year's class. So an early enrollees can go towards the previous year's class. Notre Dame had a lot of pre, you know guys in the 2021 class that they put towards 2020 and, and vice versa to get to the 25. The problem for Notre Dame is 85. That That, that number hasn't changed. And unless the NCAA is willing to expand that a little bit, Notre Dame is still going to be pretty tight on numbers. As far as guys they lead on, I I don't know if I'd go down to say lead. I think they're in a very good position uh, with Xavier Nwankpa. I think they're in the top group with Anthony Lucas, Hero Canoe, uh, Major Everhart. Offensive lines is a mess right now. Uh, I don't think they lead for Quinshawn Judkins. If if he was if I were to pick right now, I'd probably pick one of the Southern schools, either Auburn or Ole Miss. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I if they wanted Xavier Bradshaw, they could have him. They'd lead for him if they wanted him, but they don't want him for some reason. It just blows my mind. But lead, no. Do they have a shot to close on a bunch of them? Yeah, it's just going to depend on how their visits go. I mean, a lot of these guys we talked about, their status hasn't really changed much since the summer with Notre Dame because they haven't visited since the summer. So after the USC game, you know, Nawak will have been on campus by then. Anthony Lucas will have been on campus by then. I think Hero Canoe will have been on campus by then. We'll have a much better feel for where things stand at that point in time. John Long, just stopping by to drop a like and tell you I can't wait to catch the replay later. This game goes into OT. Boy, I hope you're wrong. Michael Johnson asks, if Quinn has no value, why should he come back? And also, why can't why can't Jordan uh, tell him be moved to linebacker? Okay, a couple things here. First part, uh, I think Jeff Quinn does have value. I think Jeff Quinn has value in ways that that maybe aren't necessarily coaching the offensive line. I think he brings value to what Notre Dame can do from a game planning standpoint. I think he can bring things from a big picture standpoint. Uh, he was a guy that was you know, pretty well respected by Brian Kelly for helping him put together game plans and things like that. I think, and that's why I think as an analyst, he could bring some value. I just don't think he brings a lot of value as an offensive line coach, but I I don't think that, that, that there's necessarily, you know, bring him back as a, as a, um, as a position coach. I, I don't think he, to me, doesn't bring value there, but I do think Jeff Quinn being part of the program in some capacity 
there is some value to that. That that is one. Er well, I do I do think he brings some in that regards. John Long says, hoping the O line from last week's fourth quarter shows up. I mean, they had one good play in the fourth quarter. Sorry about that. I am not sure what happened there. Our connection has gone uh, has gone a little haywire here. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you all can hear me. Can you all let me know down there at the bottom? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Looks like we're back and uh, good to go now. All right. So I have no idea what happened. All right. So I I lost a lot of questions there because we were working through those. I got booted when I when I got. Uh, got kicked out there. I have no clue what happened. So, uh, but John, I, look, they started to get a little bit more movement last week. I hope that that's a sign of things to come. Uh, I just, I need to see it. And look, Wisconsin's front seven is a lot better than Purdue's front seven outside of George Karloftis. It's definitely better. Uh, Chad Williams, B BD is a cultured individual. Who knew? Hey, man, football, beverages, analysis, and ballet. Hey, man, you know what? You got to have, you got to, you got to be cultured. You got to know all types of things. You know what I mean? I'm trying to think of what movie that was from. I was like, I'm cultured. I can't remember, can't remember what movie that was from. Uh, John Zabrowski says, wait, Liam didn't, didn't Liam start as a freshman? No, he didn't start till he was a junior. He did not start in 2016. He did, barely played in 2017. He redshirted in 2016, barely played in 2017. His first start came against Michigan in 2018. He was a junior, a redshirt sophomore junior. Troy McIntosh says, Elson is highly respected and has put guys in the league. Does he have any input on what he sees on the technique of, of our O-line? I doubt during the season. That, that's He's got enough things to worry about, you know, getting his defensive line ready. That's just not a, a That's just not his job. And it wouldn't matter anyway. If Brian Kelly doesn't see it, it doesn't matter who else sees it. Brian Kelly is the one who could have an, a say on that. And until it becomes important to him, it doesn't matter if it's important to anybody else. I've got a super chat down here. Let me go grab it real quick from Zach Garza. Zach says, glad I found – thank you for the super chat, by the way, Zach. Glad I found the show. Gives me my Notre Dame fix each week, even in the offseason. This game worries me and doesn't at the same time. I feel Wisconsin is usually overrated but we haven't looked too hot either. I think that's really good analysis. I, I, I'm, I am not, I am really not concerned about Wisconsin. I'm, I'm more concerned about Notre Dame. I mean, that's that this is, this is a game about Notre Dame. If Notre Dame plays their game, then they'll be fine. They'll win. And I think they'll win somewhat comfortably. Uh, if Notre Dame doesn't play their game, then it, it, it could be a struggle. It's this. This is a more about Notre Dame than it is about Wisconsin. I, I think Wisconsin in the last couple of years has been overrated. Uh, they haven't had the teams that we saw. I mean, they had like that thirteen and one team. What was it like twenty sixteen something like that? Um, they the, the last few years, however, I'm, I'm looked that up. It was twenty seventeen. They went thirteen and one, battled Ohio State in the Big Ten title game, and then went to a, the postseason, beat Utah, beat Miami in a bowl game. Their big win in the regular season was like Northwestern. It was a down year for a lot of teams that year. And then the next year they went out and they went eight and five. Then the next year they went 10 and four. Then last year they went four and three. And then this year they're one and one. I, I don't get the infatuation that a lot of people in the national media have and then Vegas and whoever else have for Wisconsin. However, to your point, I think it's spot on. Notre Dame hasn't really done anything to instill a great deal of confidence that they are going to be able to go out and play their game either. And, you know, to me, until they do that, then we're going to continue to, to have some of these problems. Sunset Kid, I'd be number one. I appreciate that. Mr. Adam Yola says, not hoping that Notre Dame wins. We will win. I like it. 
Keith Sellner, can you remember a year in which an otherwise good team was held back by one position group the way this team is being hampered by the offensive line? Quarterback in 2019? Um uh, yeah, I think we've I think we've seen this quite a bit actually under Brian Kelly. Uh, you know, I, I think 2015. I look at that team and say, you know, you say one position group. I don't know if it was one position group, but one coach held that team back. Uh, in 2014, the defensive line became a huge problem down the stretch. When you look at uh, you know. The last few games when Sheldon Day got hurt, Tron Jones got hurt. You know, I think that became a big problem. I think there's been, I think we've seen that quite a bit from Notre Dame, sadly. And that's been the frustration is there always seems to be like that one thing about Notre Dame that, boy, if you could put this team with that group or, the, you know, take this quarterback from that team and, you know, take this guy from there, boy, this team would be really good. And he hasn't been able to put it all together, which is uh, a little frustrating. Craig Sebring says, does the 12 o'clock worry you that we won't be ready? Uh, no, I, I actually I actually think sometimes the earlier starts can be good for you, especially when you're you're away from home and Notre Dame's going to head up to Chicago today. Uh, I think it's one of those things where you you get up, you have breakfast, you you do what you do your thing at the hotel, and then you go to the game and you're getting ready and you go play. I, I kind of like it as opposed to Guys laying around at locker room, the headset on, listening to music, trying to focus for a three thirty game or an eight o'clock game. I think I think there can be some merit to it. And you know, trying to think back, some of the times Notre Dame has played earlier games, I don't remember a whole lot of noon games. I'm trying to look at this, but they've had some of the times they've had earlier games is is when they've they've actually played pretty well. I mean, the one that pops off my head is 2016. You know, they were coming off the loss to Duke. I think they had a, a noon kickoff against Syracuse, I believe, and they came out and played great that game. And they didn't play great a whole lot that year. And there's a lot of people that thought Syracuse was going to work them that game. A lot of people. AJ says, uh, not Notre Dame related, but I live in Lansing and Spartans are pretty fired up about their team this year. Their running back transfer from Wake Forest is special. Curious what your thoughts are on Mel Tucker. Honestly, I don't really have much of an opinion on Mel Tucker. He was pretty much an unknown to me. You know, had had been a longtime defensive coach in the NFL and then had a, what, a year or two stint as the defensive line coach or, or excuse me, defensive coordinator at Georgia, but it was really Kirby's defense and you know, goes out to Colorado for a year and then takes over and he's got the COVID stuff at Michigan State and it's like really an unknown. But I, I'll tell you what, boy, he's got that team playing hard. I I watched some of the Miami game and I'm watching these Michigan State linemen come off. the And none of these guys have the talent of Notre Dame's best players. And they're coming off the ball and they're hitting Miami and they're just, just pounding their feet, driving through contact. They're playing physical. They're playing hard. Uh, you know, and it, and it looks in a lot of ways like a vintage Michigan State team. I mean, they're running the ball, they're physical, they're playing, flying around fast defense, and they're just, I mean, they, they've they looked good so far. I mean, they've looked really good. I thought the Northwestern game, I watched that at my cousin's house uh, the night before the Florida State game, and I'm like, oh, hey, you know what? They're playing really well, but, you know, Northwestern stinks. And so I didn't pay a ton of attention to it, to be honest with you. But I liked how they played. And then beat Youngstown State the next week. And I'm like, yeah, you know, whatever. And then they go out and they just beat the dog snot out of Miami, at Miami. And I'm like, okay, all right, this Michigan State team is not playing around. And it looked like a vintage Michigan State team. And to be able to kind of get that going this early, I think says a lot about Mel Tucker and his ability to get this team motivated to play. Uh, so, I mean, so far, again, I, I haven't paid a ton of attention to him. They haven't really made a lot of splashes on the recruiting trail, although they got a really good quarterback in the 2022 class, kid that's out at St. John Bosco's quarterback. But, I mean, the guy's coached 22 games at Michigan State. He's 10 and 12 overall. So it's like, Went five and seven in one year at Colorado, and that got in the Michigan State job. You're like, how did that happen? You know, like, okay, his resume as an assistant coach, how did that happen? 
and you know goes two and five at Michigan State, and and last year, I mean, they looked awful last year. But I didn't really, I didn't really hold that against them because, as I've said about a lot of Big Ten teams, I just kind of dismissed last year's Big Ten season because of, in fair, I mean, you're, you're taking over a new program that's going through turmoil, and then you got to deal with COVID, and your state's got these really harsh restrictions and rules, and you can't practice this, and you can't do that, and there's all these things you can't do. I held nothing against, especially first year coaches last year. And then he comes out this year, and you're like, I don't know what to make of them, and I don't have high expectations because they, they look. D'Antonio and his staff did not recruit well as well in his last few years, so it's not like Mel Tucker's inheriting this great situation. And like you mentioned, I mean, their best player has been Kenneth Walker, who transferred from Wake Forest, who was a good running back at Wake Forest, and he's been excellent, excellent for them so far. I mean, he's averaging eight point seven yards per carry. Uh, had 172 yards against Miami, had 264 against Northwestern. This kid's a good football player. He had 579 last year. He was uh, in, in. He really only played seven games. He had three straight 100 yard games last year. 2019, he ran for over 500 yards again. He's always been kind of like the number two back. Transfers to Michigan State this year, and he's he's been excellent. Can they continue it as they get into Big Ten season? We'll find out. That's going to tell us a lot about Mel Tucker. But so far, I mean. Gosh, I mean, I'm sh- I'm shocked at how good they've been this year and how hard they play. I mean, they play hard and they play together. I, I really like how they're playing so far. But I don't – what he's doing to make that happen, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. I just know it's been fun to watch. Uh, Daniel Wade, Brian, any suggestions on how I can see the game through your eyes analytically? And just listen to what I say and, I mean, you say – Books maybe I can read. Not, I mean, not that I'm, not that I could point to, not that I'm aware of. I, I think for me, it's just more about experience. I mean, I, I started recording football games, NFL games, when I was a little kid. My dad went and got a v, you know, VHS recorder, one of those big things with all the parts in it. it cost several hundred dollars from Curtis Mathis, and started re- recording games on VHS. And then I'd watch the games and I'd study them and. And that's just kind of how I developed my passion for football. I was always kind of a stats guy. You know, I was kind of, you know, my dad likes to joke that he'd walk into my room at night and I'm supposed to be in bed and I'm under the covers with a flashlight on. And, you know, what the heck do you think your 10 year old son doing in that situation? And he, you know, walks in and I'm drawing up plays or I'm, you know, t- taking the Cincinnati Reds stats and figuring out batting averages and things like that. You know, just always kind of stuff's always interested me. But and then I played the game, I coached the game for seven years and, you know, try to look at it from a coaching standpoint. So, I mean, seeing it through my eyes, I mean, just think, think about it. What, what, think about it like a coach, you know, I think that would be the thing I'd say to look through is just try to think of the game through the, through the, think about the game from a, how do you play the game? How do you coach, you know, what leads into success? And I think sometimes a lot of the data driven stuff that, that people like to point to uh, as if it can be predictive is I, I don't necessarily gr- think there's some merit to that. There's some value to that, but at the end of the day, it's about how are you preparing your players? How are you calling it? You know, why did you call this play? What did it, what worked? You know, if you're a, a member of the Irish Breakdown Message Board, I, I put a video breaking down Kyron Williams' touchdown pass, the first touchdown pass. And we're going to try to do more. We're still working through some technical problems with StreamYard. But, uh, you know, we're hoping to make that more and more of a feature of the mess. It's going to be for the message board only. So, because, uh, you know, some of the stuff we have to have has to be premium. And there's, Reasons why that particular feature is premium, uh, but uh, you know, and then just kind of engage me. Look, Daniel. I mean, if you come on the message board and and you ask questions, I mean, I'll explain things in great detail. And sometimes, I mean, somebody asked me the other day, talking about the play where Jack Cone threw the ball out of bounds, and he looks at it and he sees Kevin Austin three, four yards down the field, wide open, and it's like, well, why you miss that play? Well, you know, take a screenshot, show kind of how it went through, and just talk football. And I think that's the biggest thing is just. You know, listen to people that you respect their their football knowledge and just be a sponge and then be critical of them and not critical from a criticizing them, but be critical of, you know, don't just take what they say, but but why are they saying it and how does it apply and and how can you can you learn that way? I think that's really the biggest thing as far as reading books. I mean, just just I mean, listen to any, you know, the, Steve Sarkees has got a great RPO video out. There's a Really good Lincoln Riley video out from a coach's clinic where he's talking about quarterback play and quarterback drills. Watch that stuff. You know, listen to them. I think those are the best ways to do it. I'm not really familiar with any books uh, that I would necessarily read that would would help you, in my opinion. 
Jack L- Lassen says Drake Bowen timeline and top contenders other than Notre Dame. Uh, Clemson, I'm going to try to pull up his top five. I know Clemson's on his top five. I believe Auburn is in his top five. Uh, Notre Dame is in his top five. Indiana is in his top five. Let me see here. Try to find his top five. It's um, Notre Dame, LSU, Auburn, Clemson, and Indiana are his top five. So when he plans on making a decision, my understanding is, is it's not going to be until next year uh, is, is kind of what I had always been told. Now, could he make a decision sooner? Sure. But my understanding is that he was not going to make one until next year. And baseball is going to be a big, big part of his decision. Brendan Burtis says, how does Nwankba's recruitment look? There's been people reporting that it's down to Iowa and, and Notre Dame. I still think Ohio State's in the mix, but I do think Notre Dame is in much better position. We've been saying this for a long time. The longer this goes on, the, the better it is for Notre Dame. Now, they got to keep winning. they got to keep recruiting them. they got to get them on campus. Right now, Iowa's hot, uh, but I still feel really good about where Notre Dame stands with things. Orange glove guy. Can watching Jack Cohn take multiple sacks scare quarterback prospects away? Um, depending on how you're meaning that, I would say potentially, yeah. I think Notre Dame has a spinny kind of answer for that about, you know, they're down to their third left tackle and, you know, a bunch of new starters and all that. And some kids are going to buy that. But at the end of the day, it, this can't go on for 12 games. At some point in time, they're going to have to start playing better. And if they do, and by the second half of the year, the offensive line is playing better. Quarterbacks won't won't remember the first half of the season. Searcher Green says, I've been kick been predicting close games all year. I got Notre Dame 50 to 6 to 24 this week. I see Cone going off on a defense that, no, that he knows extremely well. Wow. Yeah, Searcher, you have been super conservative with your scores so far this year. So that surprises me because teams just don't score 56 on Ohio, on Wisconsin very often. I'm trying to look at their schedule now. And, and, uh, yeah, I don't see, I mean, I know Ohio state did that to them back in 20 scored 59, nothing in the big 10 title game. But since then I'm trying to see most the next year was 35 to Bama 16. The most they gave up was 38 to Penn state 17. The most they gave up was 24 to Miami Northwestern in wins 2018 See 38 to Michigan, 44 to Purdue in a win, and 37 to Minnesota in a loss. That was an 8-5 team. 2019, 34 to Ohio State in the Big Ten title game, and then 38 to Ohio State in the regular season. Then last year, 28 was the most they gave up. So, yeah, that would shock me, that much of a blow up. But if you're right, that would be great news because, look, Jack Cohn can go off. And I get what you're saying and, and and all that and could see that happening. But that can't happen without the offensive line playing really well. So that would that would be the bigger takeaway for me is if the line plays well, I think Jack Cohn go off on anybody. I really do. Uh, but the offensive line has to play well. So if they put a 56 on Wisconsin tomorrow, unless it's like three or four scores that come from turnovers, that would make me feel really good, really, really good about the rest of the season. Q Kibbs 97 calling it now. Buckner connects on a short pass, uh, a short pass, shot pass, shot pass play. Excuse me. Fingers crossed it's Lindsay or Austin. So he's talking about a downfield shot. Yeah. I mean, if he if he's healthy in place tomorrow, I would love to see that. They've tried that a couple times. He just hasn't had time to throw. Sunset Kid, happy birthday to my mom. She turned 75 today. Yes, very much happy birthday to your mother. That is awesome. 75. That's a that's happy. Send, send the best to your mom from all of us at Irish Breakdown. Absolutely. Justin Hunter, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much does it concern you that Wisconsin has only allowed 33 rushing yards per game? Uh, it, it's very concerning, especially when you consider the fact that Notre Dame hasn't run the ball very well. Um, I, I guess part of it is I don't. You know, you say, hey, well, you know, but those two teams they played so far don't run the ball very well either. Well, neither does Notre Dame. Uh, it's concerning to me. I think part of that is because they're just, like I said, they're really good up in the front seven. I, I just, Notre Dame should be able to run enough to keep them honest. 
that's the big thing for me. I don't Notre Dame doesn't need to run for 250 yards. They just need to run enough to keep Wisconsin honest. That's the big thing. Clash more, Mike. How will Notre Dame counter if Wisconsin's offensive line is bullying the defensive front? A lot of linebacker crashes, getting the safeties involved in the box, uh, slants and stunts. Don't stand there and just take blocks. Get them moving, twist stunts. Um, you don't want to do too many stunts where you're he's going here and he's going there with your lineman because if you get caught in the the schemes that they run, they'll catch you in that and just wall you off and just have this big, huge run lane. So a lot of more slants with the line than bring the linebackers other directions, just be aggressive that way. I think that is when I would probably go to a 3-3 three, three, and that people don't like, but I'd put Fosky off the ball and i just have him crash inside just as hard as he can, give him a running start. I think that's um, those are the things you're going to do. But if that's happening, that's that that's going to be scary. Paul Rose, throw Wisconsin off, start Buckner and 11 personnel, run four birds and air it out. I would still rather see Jack Cohn doing that. But I, I like the idea of going deep first play. I, I don't dislike that at all, so assuming you can protect it. JoJo Pineda, good afternoon, fellas. Happy Friday. Odd time for a good matchup on Saturday at 12 noon. A little nervous from hearing everything about O-line. Goodness, they are making it sound like Wisconsin is Bama. We show, pray we show up. I'm with you. Indy fan 8807, if Heinish doesn't play, besides Lacey, who will you get in the rotation more? Aiden Kiana Ana or Gabriel Rubio. Thanks for the great content and everybody at Irish Breakdown. I personally would like to see Aiden Kiana Ana get a shot, but I, I don't know if if that's necessarily an answer in this game uh, since he hasn't played really the first two games. I don't know if you just want to throw him into the Wisconsin game. You know, I would have liked to see him work in a little bit earlier in the season. They haven't done that. I, I think that what you have to do is you have to say, hey, look, it's we're going with Howard Cross, we're going with Jacob Lacey. You know, maybe they move. Uh, maybe they move. At you know, um, you know, maybe they do some things with Jason Adamiola in the nose. Maybe you know, I think there's some things they can do to throw Wisconsin off and not just have that one player over the center all day. But uh, if Heinish doesn't play, that certainly would 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 be a cause for concern because none of the other guys, except for Count on and Rubio, the two guys you mentioned, the other guys that have actually played, Lacey and Cross. They're 270, 275 pounds. They're not big guys. They're rotation guys, not everyday guys. Chief Brody says, I am always, I am very concerned. I hate to say even my ironic pessimistic prediction for this week because it keeps seeming to happen every time I mention it here. Then don't say it. Don't ruin it. Drew Stevens Saint Drew Stevens Saint Blaze. Hey everybody. Hey Drew. Thanks for joining us. The Trek reviewer does Watkins play special teams? I'm not sure who Watkins is. I'm drawing a blank on who Watkins is. D Rock Irish, Wisconsin insider reporter, in indicating that Billy Shrouth named All American Bowl and Shrouth is indicating his decision is coming soon. Down to Notre Dame, Wisconsin. Any thoughts or tea leaves, Brian? Yeah, um, my every all my thoughts and tea leaves are pointing to him going to Wisconsin. I, I don't think, and I don't think game, tomorrow's game is going to matter a ton. I'd be shocked right at this point in time if he ends up in Notre Dame, which is saying a lot when you consider that he was basically committed to Notre Dame at one point in time. Sean Higgins says, thanks, Domer. Haven't been up since USF debacle. Should be a great weekend. Yeah, let's not talk about that. Chief Brody says, wouldn't it be ironic and terrible for Merch to go crazy and throw for 300 yards? I really, really can't wait for the new NCAA game. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, Florida Irishman, Notre Dame uses its speed on offense and defense to dominate this game. Notre Dame 41-9. to That'd be quite a domination. I don't see it, but I would love it if it happened. <laughs> all right sean higgins says subconsciously ordered cheese curds at lunch today they were delicious not sure if that's a good or bad thing for tomorrow i think i could spin it either way let's spin it in a good way like you know you you see notre dame eating up uh, uh you know the guys from wisconsin tomorrow so let's hope that's what that means 
Uh, Drew Stevens St. Blaise says, I just don't see Notre Dame becoming a different team o- over a week, but I think if whoever scores a defensive TD wins. I mean, I, I don't see it. It could happen. I'm not predicting it uh, for, I think, the reasons behind why you're saying what you're saying. It's, I need to see it to believe it at this point in time. Jared Hart again. Appreciate you, Coach. Given the O-line struggles, do you consider, think there will be more 12 personnel on the field? Geez, look at how much we miss Tommy Tremble. Played lights out on Thursday night. I don't think 12 personnel is the answer because, number one, the tight ends haven't been blocking very well either. I think the problem, if you go 12 personnel, to have to be able to run the ball, you now limit yourself as a pass offense, and that then takes away from what you are good at. I think what Notre Dame has to do is they have to spread the field they have to get Wisconsin in space. They have to use their speed as as who was it up here? Florida Irishman was saying, use your speed, get them in isolation. So we talked about this on Tuesday. We talked about this yesterday. Spread the field, get isolations, throw quick game, get your screen game going, do things to negate the advantage they have up front. There are things you can do uh, that Tommy Reese has not done in some areas he has, some areas he hasn't. There are things he still hasn't done that I think he can do to protect the fact that the offensive line hasn't played well. Then if the offensive line starts playing well, now you have even more up your uh, tricks up your sleeve. Uh, I think if you're going to go 12, 13 personnel, I would say you need to do some things early to try to maybe get a max pro shot or something like that. Uh, Meaning, you know, you you have three tight ends, maybe two or three of them are blocking and maybe just take a one-on-one shot to Kevin Austin or Braden, Braden Lindsay outside or, you know, maybe run like kind of delay throwback to your tight end on that or something like that. I mean, there's some things that they could do, but you can't consistently do that because it's going to limit your ability to throw the ball. And if and if you're taking away from what you do best to protect the part of the game you don't do well, that doesn't help you. It makes you worse. You need to use the things you do well to even a greater degree to protect what you don't do well is the way that I think they should go with it. Irishman 7114, been off work the last few days and spending some quality time with my wonderful wife. That sounds like a lot of fun. I'm getting back, finally getting back to a live show. Love the work you guys do. Go Irish 24 to 10, I hope. I, I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> okay. Here we are. Let's get down here. Okay, a lot of comments. And I'm finally at the section where I got kicked out of the room. So I'm glad that we're back there. We got a super chat here from Wendell. I get all the hype surrounding the terrific success in our recruiting of late, but do you honestly feel like Notre Dame under Kelly has made the most of the talent that we've already had during his tenure? Most of the most time not, Wendell, honestly. I mean, you know, I still look at the 2015 and 2017 teams and, and I look at them and I think about what those teams could have been if he would have done some things different. You know, what could that 2015 team have been if he'd, have, if he'd have realized after 2014 what everybody knew, which was Brian Van Gorder wasn't the guy. I mean, we all knew that uh, after 2014. Brian Kelly was late to recognize that. What if he would have hired a Mike Elko type of guy in 2015? What if he would have hired a Matt Bayless type of uh, uh, strength conditioning coordinator a couple years earlier? What could he have done with a team that had three first-round picks on the offensive line? Will Fuller, C.J. Procise, Chris Brown, Amir Carlisle, Deshaun Kaiser, Malik Zaire, in a defense that had Jalen Smith and Sheldon Day and uh, Isaac Rochelle and Jerron Jones and Jerry Tillery. Uh, is, was part of that 2015 team. You've got Cole Luke, Kavari Russell, Max Redfield, Elijah Shoemate, Niles Morgan, uh, Greer Martini, James on Wall. I mean, there's a lot of guys that were really good college football players or could have been really good college football players. And you say, really, what did you do with that group? I mean, think of the think of the number of NFL guys that were on the 2011 team that went eight and five. You know, so yeah, I don't, I don't think for much of his tenure he has gotten the most out of it, and I think part of the recent success has been that the schedules have been a little easier than they were early on. So, I don't think he's gotten the most out of uh, of his teams for the most part. Having said that, I think the recent trends in recruiting, if they can continue, 
have are, are giving Notre Dame a, 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 the kind of talent across the board skill wise they didn't have back then. There was always holes, even on those teams I'm talking about. There was always holes somewhere, whether it was depth or defensive line or linebacker. There was a somewhere quarterback where there was a hole. And and to me, I think the position coach coaching is better on defense, you know, and the coordinating is better on defense in some of those teams with Marcus Freeman, you know, Clark Lee and then now Marcus Freeman. Uh, I think that the concern I have, however, is that the one thing you should always be able to count on at Notre Dame is that you're going to have a good offensive line and that you're going to have very, very good offensive line recruiting. The fact that that's not happening right now is kind of my big concern because if, if you step up your skill, but then you take a step back on line play, then you're right back to where you were. It's just it's just a different form of it. But uh, hopefully he uh, hopefully he steps up. I got booted down a little bit, so I did miss some questions. If I have missed a question of yours, there are very very few questions that we just skipped, and some, a lot of them were ones that we'd already addressed. Uh, if if there's a question that's above that I did not get to, please put it in there. And and it's not because we are ignoring you. It's that we get booted and we just lose questions at some point in time. So I'm down here at the 207 mark here. So this was a comment about why I like kind of like noon games. And he said, BD is absolutely correct. He says, former D1 baseball player myself, downtime is not good for motivated athletes. It, it I, I, That's why I don't necessarily love night games. I kind of get outside your routine. And, and Chad will tell you, athletes are creatures of habit. And when you do things that take you out of your habits, it can mess you up like a Sunday game or a Thursday game or a night game when you're used to playing early, things like that. I like to be able to get up and let's get to work. Let's get to business. Nothing else is on our mind today and get to work. Be curious to hear this. Daniel Wade says, anyone else, any, anyone else have any pregame rituals? Or is it just me? Those will be some interesting answers. Chief Brody says, I'm going to the Michigan State game tomorrow with my buddy, who is a Sparty fan. Hopefully Indy wins, uh, else I'm going to be miserable all night. Yes. And what time is that game tomorrow? I'm curious. Um, they got uh, Nebraska tomorrow. That'll be interesting. Ethan Broom, any update on Anthony Lucas? Believe he's visiting for USC. Really won't have an update until the visit. Let's get down here. A lot of comments. Oh no! Yeah, there's some some of, some of these we're not <laughs> we're not going to put up there. Um, Stephen D. Kish says, "Do you think Notre Dame will dip into the transfer portal next year? If so, what spots will they try to get?" I I really don't love the idea of Notre Dame dipping into the transfer portal too much, but I think positions I would look at for next year. You may have to go receiver if you if you end up losing is like they're thin now. If you lose, uh, if you lose Austin and Lindsey after this year, boy, with with the inability of this current coach uh, to develop young players, it gets me concerned. So you may have to go uh, transfer portal. Chad Williams says that. Um, you know, to me. I, that's one I think, you know, for me, part of it depends on who goes pro. Like if Isaiah Foskey goes pro uh, after this year, and I'm not saying he will, but I mean, he's a junior. If he has a big year, I mean, he's currently 11th in the nation in sacks. If he keeps doing that, then obviously things could change. But, um, you know, for me, it's about if he goes pro, then, you know, you may need to look at the transfer portal for some depth at defensive end. If, um, you know, if, if, 
something happens where there's a bad injury in the spring, you may have to go somewhere. I, you know, safety might be a position you're going to be forced to look at the transfer port. I think so. The two that I would look at without, you know, without knowing who's going to come back, I'd say probably receiver and safety, the first two that would pop in my head. If Austin and Lindsay decide to come back, then I don't think receiver is an issue. You've got Merriweather coming in. You've got CJ Williams coming in. As of right now, Maureen Walker is going to be coming in. Uh, if you lose him, they'll find somebody else to replace him. And then you'll have everybody coming back. I, I Safety, I look at safety. I mean, Hamilton, I think, is going to be gone. I don't, I don't know about Houston Griffith. Uh, you know, you bring DJ Williams back for fifth year. You've got Litchfield, Ajavon, and the two freshmen. I'd like to see them move Isaac, you know, Xavier Watts there since he's clearly not in their plans of receiver. You know, move, try to get him maybe going to safety, but you don't really have anyone at safety right now in the incoming class. And even if you do land Xavier in the walk, I don't think that necessarily means you can't look at safety in the transfer portal as well. But I don't think transfer portals is end all be all that, that a lot of people think it is. Because if guys were that good and that veteran, that impactful, they'd be going to the NFL, not transferring to Notre Dame. Doug Lapachin says, I'll be coming to Cincinnati game. Will you guys be there? We'll be there. We're not tailgating that day, but we'll be there. Uh, I would I would say that anyone who, um, if you all are at the Cincinnati game and we'll we'll be there, we won't be tailgating. Let me know where you are. You know, send me a picture of where you're tailgating, and we'll do our best to come swing by. I'd love to love to meet people. It doesn't always have to be just at our tailgates. Daniel Wade said, "I will sign up for the message board. Appreciate your time. Oh, I appreciate you signing up. And anyone that wants to sign up, if you just go to the link below, it says boards.irishbreakdown.com, and uh, it's four ninety nine a month or forty nine ninety nine for a year. It's definitely the cheapest, uh, the least expensive site that you're going to find. A lot of good stuff there. A lot of good stuff." Doug LaPatchen says, nobody is picking Notre Dame. I think that will put a fire under our guys. Everyone at Irish Breakdown picked Notre Dame to win this game. Like all of me, Vince, Grant Lavecchio, even Mike Hutton picked Notre Dame to win. Uh, a lot of our contributors, Sean Davis picked them to win. Ryan Roberts picked them to win. So uh, we picked them to win. I don't know about everybody else, but we definitely did. Jared Hargis says, hey, coach, you seem pretty confident in that Nebraska versus Oklahoma game. Not the exact results I was expecting either. Yeah, I had – I mean, I don't know how the heck that game was close. Nebraska's been garbage this year so far. And Oklahoma – I mean, they could have lost that game. I, I just – this has been the weirdest freaking year so far. It's ridiculous how weird this year has been. Like, game – I'm like, oh, come on. That's like, how's Iowa going to win games and I'm getting to 200 yards of offense? And blowing teams out with barely 200 yards of offense. It's – it's been a weird year so far. Braden says, do you think Notre Dame can compete this year? Uh, I guess I would want to know, compete with who? Um, I think if Notre Dame plays their game, I think they compete with anybody. I'm not super confident they're going to be able to play their game a lot right now based on what we've seen, but if they play their game, they can compete with anybody. David Knight says, Iowa will get their comeuppance soon enough. I don't disagree with you. Fortnite Blaze, just give Bayless the O-line coaching job. At least we know they'll have some intensity. <laughs> I mean, at this point in time, yeah, why not? Let the GA and Bayless do it. Irish Joe, 42-6 to six Notre Dame. I love it. Uh, Chad Williams says, if Notre Dame scores 56, I'm streaking on the field. Okay, so um, I am now hoping that uh, that Notre Dame gets 56 just because I want to hear the story from Vince afterwards about Chad getting arrested for streaking on the field. David Knight, I was in Qatar when I saw that score when uh, Ohio State beat them 59 nothing. I was like, holy cow, Batman. Yeah, that was that's what got Ohio State, in my opinion, in the playoff when they did because that was a good Wisconsin team. I think, I mean, you know, again, it was the the Big Ten championship game, right? And you know, that that was a that was a really good Wisconsin team. And to beat them the way that they did and just just blast them and just blow them off the field was really surprising. You know, that was a Wisconsin team that was 11 and three that year. They lost to LSU in the opener by four. I think that wasn't that. No, that wasn't the game at Lambeau. I think Wisconsin, that was a couple years later. Uh, lost to Northwestern on the road that year, beat Iowa, beat Minnesota. I mean, that was a pretty good Wisconsin team, perception wise. Like a lot of Wisconsin teams, they hadn't really beaten anybody that was any good, but perception wise. And then they went and beat Auburn in a bowl game. Uh, but yeah, that was. That was a big surprise for me. A super chat from Andrew Rhodes. The entirety of Pro Football Focus just picked Notre Dame to win this morning. There are a few guys I trust picking Wisconsin, but some of it is bad analysis. So, yeah, that would be um, 
I just, I just, yeah, I don't see it. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't see what's. Look, Wisconsin can absolutely win this game. I'd have a hard time picking them because I just don't. I don't see this Wisconsin team as being this perfect team and this great team that people make them out to be. Uh, I just think it's more about just Notre Dame not playing their game and, not, and playing poorly. David, thank you for the super chat, Andrew, very, very much. David Knight, I like this. Seeing someone pound Miami is always gratifying. I agree. Agree with you completely. Whew. Zach Nichols, serious question. Would it be better for the program if the line implodes badly enough for Quinn to be let go or for Notre Dame to hang around in the playoff conversation all year only to fall off? I don't ever think imploding is a good thing because there'd be a lot of recruits you would lose. And I don't know if I'm willing to sacrifice that. That's a that's a good that's a well, that's a good question, Zach. I, I just don't think I can ever necessarily say it's good to lose like that, meaning like just you know, like 2016 ish type of implosion, a 2014 type of late season finish. But again, I, I don't know if a, a 2014 implosion would change anything. I mean, no one that was responsible for the implosion that season suffered any consequences. So the, at least that I can remember. So I don't, I don't know that it would really change anything to be honest with you. And he brought Byron Van Gorder back the next year. So I don't think it would change much. 2016 was a different deal because he had no choice but to change in 2016. And I just don't see how that could be good for the program. Especially now in this era of being able to transfer right away, because not only would you lose recruits, you'd lose a lot of your players. Okay, Chief Brody, Notre Dame's going to look like me on Madden: fifty throws, five hundred yards, ten runs for two hundred for twenty yards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that. Uh... Yeah, that would that yeah that wouldn't shock me. Five hundred, you know, I get I get the point. Yeah, yes. Uh, Jake from State Farm, love this name. This would be one of the most challenging best wins of Brian Kelly's tenure if they pull it off. I don't think that. Uh, no, I, I'd have to. Dis I love the name, but I'm going to disagree with this. I don't think this is a very good Wisconsin team. If Notre Dame beats Wisconsin tomorrow, they're going to be one and two, with their only win being over Eastern Michigan. Um, I didn't think this was a great team coming into the season. It's a good team. It's probably the toughest individual matchup for Notre Dame of the season just because it's away from home and the physicality and all that type of stuff. But no, uh, I, I don't think this is a huge win in my opinion. I mean, you're Notre Dame. You're supposed to beat Wisconsin. Uh, just I don't. I can't call it a, a big win. I just, I just can't. Got another super chat. This one from John A. Staff. What is the priority coaching – what is the priority coaching attribute to you, teaching fundamentals, technique, uh, advanced position technique, or advanced scheme fundamentals? It depends on the position. So for me, defensive coordinator, it's technique first, scheme second, but it's very close. Uh, with offense, it's technique first by a mile, then scheme. Uh I, for most positions, the coordinator, I kind of want to be the scheme guy, you know? So if I have a coordinator, who's a, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of why I think, you know, having a coordinator who, who maybe coaches quarterbacks is a good thing because, you know, you can have a GA help you out, but you know, with quarterback, it's a lot of it is the scheme is so important to teaching your quarterback that he has to know that. And a lot of quarterbacks nowadays, especially, are kind of already coached on the technique once they arrive, especially big time quarterbacks. So that you don't really have to necessarily start over from scratch from them. Just don't screw them up, you know, and you can focus on technique, but like O-line coach, it's technique, technique, technique. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, to your point, the, the advanced position technique, teaching fundamental technique to me an advanced position technique. I, I'm not sure what you mean by the difference there. I think, a great coach should always be an advanced position technique. The only exception to that for me would be running back. I think running back is very much about you got to be a great recruiter. If you're not a great recruiter, you're not coaching running backs for me. I'm sorry. I don't care how good a running backs coach you are. Uh, you at least have to be a pretty good recruiter. And I think Lance here is at least a good recruiter. Um, and, and then 
but then it's like, Hey, look, just teach them the basic techniques and then just get out of their way. That's the one of the things I was taught coaching running backs. And, and, and I coached an all American running back in my one year coaching running back. It's like, look, teach them the proper footwork, teach them the proper timing of the play and let them know what their reads are. But then once they get the ball, you just get out of their way. And there were things that I would drill, like, you know, working on jump cuts and things like that to kind of accent those techniques that went into them. But at the end of the day, it's just, Hey, let them, let them go play. Don't make them. You don't want running backs thinking too much. Receivers, I kind of like the, the the advanced technique, but it depends on the receivers I have. You at least have to have the fundamental techniques. You know, being able to get off the line. You know, being able to use your hands. Those things I think can separate a good receiving core from a great receiving core. Uh, and and that's one of the things that I thought made Miami so good back when when Curtis Johnson was there. Was not only did they have great athletes, Reggie Wayne, Santana Moss, Andre Johnson. But those guys knew how to play, and that made them just unguardable in in many instances. So um, it just depends on the position. You know, defensive line, you got to have some advanced technique. But the biggest thing above all others is D line, linebacker, secondary, running back, receiver, and and offensive line more than any other. You know, quarterback. I mean, all, I can't think of a position where. In today's game, where you can't be a really good recruiter, you have to be a really good recruiter nowadays. You can't just be a great coach who can't recruit. Uh, you just it's it's more important than ever, in my opinion. Bronx ND fan, thank you for your super chat. Assuming Maris comes back healthy and playing on the same level, what would you do with the linebackers next year? Love what I'm seeing from JD. I think it's simple. I'd move JD Bertrand to Mike. And assuming Maris is back and playing like they think he can play. You have him and Will and J.D. Bertrand and Mike. That's exactly what I would do. It's right where I would go. Right where I would go. I mean, I, I think, and I think that could be a really, really nice combination. Really could. Let's get back up some more questions here. And thank you again for the for the super chat. I'm gonna try to get last few questions here. Sunset Kid, thank you, Brian, and all of IB Land for wishing my mom a happy birthday. You are very welcome. Uh, Ronald Tuck says, hey, Brian, how, how's Cone and Buckner's injuries? Cone doesn't really have an injury. The finger thing is fine. Uh, Buckner's injury, Brian Kelly hasn't told us much other than hamstring issue. I think it's just going to be a depend on how does it respond during the week. Is he able to get out there and get some practice time yesterday and – and Wednesday, if, if he got some work this week, then he'll play. If he didn't get work this week, then he won't play. It's not He doesn't have enough experience to be able to play without practicing. Brandon wants to know what all of you think about the Shamrock Series uniforms. I wish they were green. I don't really like them. I think they're kind of dull. I don't really see – I mean, I guess they like worked a bunch of Chicago stuff into it, but I, I, don't, I don't like them. I think they're kind of boring. I don't think they're bad. They've had some bad ones. I don't think they're bad. I just think they're kind of boring. Chicago Bears Productions, is it just me or do we need a big game from Kyron? Yeah, I think I mean it doesn't have to be rushing, but yeah, I think he needs to he needs to make some big plays. Look, it's it's not a coincidence that in Notre Dame's biggest game of the year so far, the biggest win of the year, excuse me, against Purdue who was the best opponent they played up to that point. It's not a coincidence. It just so happened to be the game where Kyron Williams made his greatest impact on more than just one play. You know, you you think about it. Kyron had four, three big plays now. Four. He had two returns. He had the 51-yard 51 yard run at the end, but then he has the 39-yard touchdown early in the game on fourth and three. When Kyron Williams is able to make an impact in this game, this offense is very difficult to stop. And the more plays, the more plays you can get him and Chris Tyree involved, I think the better it is for this offense. But look, Kyron's one of your best players. He's a captain. Getting him going is definitely good for this football team. Craig Sebring says, I say 31-13 Notre Dame returns a punt return. Kyron returns a punt return for a touchdown. That'd be fun to see. MCS, how much impact does the bye week have for Wisconsin tomorrow? Does that favor or hurt Notre Dame? I think it helps Notre Dame because, honestly, I, I think Wisconsin needed the practice. I mean, think think about this. If Notre Dame didn't play Purdue and the and they had a bye week and the last thing that we saw from Notre Dame was what they did against Toledo, would it, any of y'all be feeling good about tomorrow? I, I think I don't think so. Part of the optimism that people have about Notre Dame is you got to see that third game. They continue to improve. 
Wisconsin didn't blow me away with what they did at Eastern Michigan. Eastern Michigan's not very good. Uh, they lost to Penn State, couldn't score in the red zone. They threw for like 140 yards against Eastern Michigan. So I, I don't I, – if I was Wisconsin, I'd want to play last week. I'd want to play and keep working th- through things and, and continue to improve as a team. Paul Kinlan says, I will not be surprised to see a pick six or two. Uh, two would surprise me. Daniel Wade, Notre Dame needs a three-plus turnover margin to counter that we may not be able to have 10, 12 play drives. I don't think they need a 10-plus play uh, – excuse me, I don't think they need a plus three turnover margin. They just have to, you know, a couple drives, but that's where the big plays come from, you know, and that's where returns can help. I think the field position battle is going to be important. Uh, I think your punt cover team being good is going to be important, and that's, you know, so – you know, 10, 12 play drives are when you're having to go 70, 75 yards every time. If they're getting the ball at midfield, they're going to have a lot easier time to score. And that's because, you know, your your cover team pinned them inside the 10. Your defense forced a three and out, or maybe they got one first down, and then you forced a punt after that. Um, you know, and then you're back to being near midfield again. I think those are the keys to this game. I, I don't think you necessarily need to be three-plus turnover margin. Now, would it help if you have three-plus turnover margin? Sure. It doesn't hurt, but I don't think it's needed per se. The Spanky, 412, I just called you. I didn't realize that you're on the air. Man, every day from 1230, and then Friday is our is our mailbag, so those go a little bit longer, but I'll give you a shot after the show. Thank you for the super chat, obviously, very much. Let's get some more questions here before we finish things up. Paul Kinless says, Mertz gets picked off three times. That would be helpful. That would be very helpful. Okay. Richard McGinnis says, Kelly's fatal flaw is staying too long with underperforming assistance. I would agree with you on that. I would absolutely agree with you on that. Zach Garza, glad the game is at 12, 11 my time, sleep in and then wake up with not much of a wait for indie football. That is a good point. I didn't really think about that. Did not really think about that. Sunset Kid, Notre Dame 33, Wisconsin 17. There you go. I like that. Uh, Curtis Hewitt, if Notre Dame's O-line plays good from here on out, in your opinion, are they a title contender? Yes, I think they can be. There's still some other parts of their game that have to evolve, but I think that that is the thing that is holding this team back. I think if the offensive line plays good from here on out, Notre Dame, there's not a team on the schedule that that, that I think beats Notre Dame. Maybe one does because Notre Dame has an off day or whatever, but this team will win a lot of games. A lot of games. Jacob C. Notre Dame does not lose Shamrock Series games. You could say that, but there's always a first for everything, right? What was their Shamrock game in 2016? I'm trying to think of what that was. Do all anyone remember off the top of their head what the 2016 Shamrock game was? Army. Okay, yeah. They the Army stunk. Herney 777, portal should be a peripheral thing. I agree with you completely. Uh, ab- now, it, it's a good resource to fill certain holes and in, in, in depth, and maybe you lost a guy you didn't think you were going to lose, uh, but it can't be your primary way of building impact players. It just, it just can't. Garth Cassidy says, uh, hey, Brian, good afternoon. I was wondering if you heard anything, if uh, – any, if Prince Kim, is Prince Kimbo, Prince Kali going to get some snaps this weekend? I have not heard that he ha, ha, has. I've heard that there's going to be some interesting things, a linebacker, but that's not, that's not what I've heard. It wasn't about Prince Kali. It was about uh, another player too. Florida Irishman says, Cone throws 350 yards against his former team as Notre Dame pulls away in the second half. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Brandon says, yeah, weirdest freaking year that has cost me a lot of money. Hit 19 to 20 games on a parlay. And the only team to blow it for me was Notre Dame failing to cover the spread versus Toledo. Oh, that that's brutal. That's brutal. Jim Evans says, look, without Sebo and the line struggling, you need a true power back who can maybe gain two or three yards on his uh, own somewhat, somewhat uh, on his own. Uh, 
I mean, I think both the running backs have proven that they can do that. There's been plenty of times where those guys are getting yards on plays where there's nothing there. And I don't think Sebo is necessarily a power back. I think he runs hard. I don't think he's a power back. I would be curious to see at some point in time, hopefully they can get Logan Diggs involved because I think he could help this offense. But I don't think it's necessarily about um, – I don't think it's necessarily about power. I mean, sometimes it's just about, hey, you've got to be decisive and you see that hole and you just get up in there and get what you can get. I don't think it has to be a power back. It helps because power back – see, the thing about power backs is they can kind of hit you and just kind of carry you for a couple yards, right? I think it's – kind of where you're coming from but i think there's other ways to maximize yards that aren't just about being a power back i'm not saying it's bad to have a power back but i don't think it's the, it's like something they're missing it's not going to be the difference of, of what they're missing liam gang need riley mills to have a big game i agree d rock wants to know if brandon has a prediction for tomorrow and brandon said 38 to 17 irish i i like that i like that and d rock is 24 to 20 And Brandon says, I have a feeling it may be low scoring. Just hoping Notre Dame comes out firing. Uh, Robert K., did I miss any info on Heinish? You did not. Uh, Brian Kelly just said he's going to be a game time decision. And those usually don't result with a guy playing or playing a lot. Clashmore Mike, Notre Dame 21 to 9. His upsets alerts are uh, Arkansas over Texas AM, NC State over Clemson. Did you read the predictions this morning at Irish Breakdown? Because I picked both of those. Uh, Brandon did as well. I picked Arkansas to win that game, and I predicted NC State to win that game, which probably means that neither are going to win. That's why I don't gamble. Florida Irishman uh, again. Florida Notre Dame forty-one to nine. If they spread out Wisconsin, thirteen to nine. If they try to pound the ball. By the way, the touchdown is from the defense. Interesting. The Spanky uh, four one two says, "I hate playing at noon. I feel like we're always sleepwalking." No, that's you. You are always sleepwalking because you have just recently gotten up, Spanky. You know that exactly. And here he he at least he recognizes it. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Paul Rose says, pressure on Mertz is the key. He makes bad decisions when he's under a lot of pressure. You are not wrong. I mean, not even just turnovers, but like throwing the ball out of bounds behind the line of scrimmage from the pocket for intentional groundings. He does not make good decisions when he's pressured. And that's why first down success is so important, Paul. And this is what we talked about yesterday, and I'll have this on, on my keys to the game that come out later this afternoon at Irish Breakdown. You've got to pressure him be on, on early downs, and you've got to stop the run on early downs because if you can stop the run on early downs – and put him in, in sort of where you kind of know they're going to pass situations, he will make mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes for him are costly. Learn First down mistake, first down success is very, very important. Benjamin Perry, if we jump out early with some big plays in the pass game, it'll be a long day for Wisconsin and Merch trying to play catch up. Hopefully this is the game plan. I agree. We talked about that yesterday as well. I completely agree with you. Completely agree with you. Uh, OC Irish fan, looking forward to Shamrock game next year in Las Vegas versus BYU. So am I, and so is Vince. We definitely plan on being out there for that game. Uh, if that is, an, I mean, we'll be out there for that game, whether it's a Shamrock game or not. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to have to try to try to start saving some money up so I can bring my my dad out there too. That'd be a lot of fun. Uh, it's fun as well. Maybe see if I can convince my sister to let us also bring my nephew Zachary out. That'd be making a guys weekend. Be a lot of fun. Oh, and yeah, we'd, we'd cover the game too. Sure. All right, uh, let's see here. Brandon says, yeah, I feel like game time decision usually means not playing. All righty. Uh, and Chief Brody, will end it with this. Chief Brody says, I've got Notre Dame 17 to 10. So that is it. So that is going to do it for today's show. I want to thank everybody for being part of uh, the show today, being with us today. Uh, make sure you check out irishbreakdown.com. If you do have not signed up for the message board, down there, boards.irishbreakdown.com. Check us out. Come give us a shot. I think you'll like it. Trying to have more and more discussion on there. The people that are involved in discussion, they are, it's been a lot of great conversation. But I want more and more people involved. And, hey, look, you come here. We're going to argue. We're going to debate. We're going to disagree at, at times. 
but we're going to talk ball and there's, it's going to be a, a level of respect there. You can also ask me questions anytime that you want and I'll do my best to answer them uh, as promptly as I can. A lot of great Notre Dame fans talking ball. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so definitely check that out. And of course, check out irishbreakdown.com. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. We will have a post game show tomorrow. Uh, so make sure you keep an eye out for that. Uh, after the game, win or lose, we have a post game show tomorrow. So you're definitely going to want to check that out. Uh, and, uh, and also of course we will have our, our Friday, we'll have our wrap up of the game Our upon further review, we'll watch more film, uh, check out irishbreakdown.com for all of our written stuff. I'm going to have my keys to the game for offense and defense coming out later today. And I also have a feature before the game tomorrow in the morning. It's sort of what to look for. What are the things that I'm going to, you know, Daniel asked, you know, how can I see the game through your eyes? Well, I try to give you some of that stuff in articles like that. It's a, you know, what to look for is, is if I'm seeing this early in the game, this is what I'm going to, I'm going to feel good about Notre Dame being able to have success in this win. So uh, make sure you look for that as well. And then, of course that's at irishbreakdown.com. So, if you're listening via podcast, give us a five star review. I would really appreciate that. It helps us to kind of get our get ourselves in front of more and more ears and eyes. So uh, appreciate everybody being part of the show. Have a great rest of your Friday. We will be back with you guys again tomorrow after the Notre Dame Wisconsin game for our uh, post game wrap up, our post game show. So have a good day. We'll talk to you again very very soon. <laughs>